Now, Hiran Mai, uh, sorry, we don't know who you are. Are you sorry or are you okay? What's going on? No, no, I'm just uh, visiting uh, Steve's channel today. Oh, yeah? So, what are you? What's your background? Are you are Christian, you... Muslim, Hindu? So are you a, are you a Jew? Are you what? Yeah, are you a Jew? I mean, Jewish. Who? Are you Christian, I mean, Hindu, Shemulian. or Muslim? Shemulian. I'm talking about Shemulian. Are, are you, you Christian? Are you Muslim? Are you Hindu? No, I'm a Hindu and Sikh simultaneously. Well, you don't look sick. You look healthy. <laughs> I've seen you before, and I've tried to ask you, and I wasn't uh, tried to talk to you, but it never worked out. So uh, yeah, it never worked. The network was very bad. Horrible yeah. network. Yes. Well, it's good did, to did see you. Did you have a conversation with him? Do you want to talk to him, or do you want to? If you want to talk to him, because I was going to go to three thirty, but that's up to you. Because if he's if he's here to talk to you, then feel free right. to talk. To him. Is there something that you would like to say, or would you just like to listen to what we're going to talk about? No, no, I want to say something. Okay. If you um, if you accept the theory of theory of evolution of uh, what is the name? His, uh, the scientist name I forgot his name. Darwin. Darwin. Darwin yes, Darwin. And then uh, then the, uh, the theory of Adam in the in the Torah, Adams and Eve. That 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 theory have to be scrapped. If you dis accept the Darwin's theory, then that's a question. Is, is there any conflict or is there any any kind of similarities between between the two theories? You know, there is a similarity between Darwin and Muhammad. You know, there, uh, the, the, but the, but it's backwards, okay? Because in Darwin, he said that that monkeys turned into people, but with yeah, Muhammad, yeah, yeah. But with Muhammad, people turned into monkeys. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of the opposite. So, I've been waiting to tell that joke for three yeah, years. Yeah. So. Uh, so, evolution is based on it taking Hinduism and applying it to science because you believe in a previous life you could have been a rat, right? Yeah, in the in previous life, I should have had a life. You no, know, what I'm saying is, was it possible in a previous life, life you were a rat? Uh, there's a possibility, maybe. Possibly, and then maybe before that you were a cockroach. Yeah, maybe possible. And before that you were like a pig. Uh, I don't know exactly the. No, but I'm saying possible. Thing. You had many yeah, lives. Possible, possible. And next life you can come back as a woman. Uh, yeah, it would be possible. And so now Darwin's theory of evolution, does it agree with this that you have many lives? past and present, and you can change forms in each past life, like past life. See, like here, maybe in the previous life, you were a gorilla, and now you became man. Next life, you're going to be a cat, and then that life after that, you're going to be a woman, and then you're going to be a rat. Does Darwin's theory of evolution agree with that? Darwin's theory of evolution, I think maybe yes. No, no sorry, I think maybe not. Darwin's theory, maybe All not. Right. Okay. So why don't we put Darwin aside, because Darwin doesn't help you or me. But I want everyone to know, in your view, there was a possibility in the previous life, life you were a cockroach, right? Yes, yes. Possibly. And you say it like, I want you to say it and smile. Say, I, I may have been a cockroach in my previous life. Smile. Say yes, it. yes. And what a beautiful religion. Okay. Now, before that, was it possible you were a monkey swinging on a tree? Yes, sir. Yes, of, of, of course. Maybe. Okay, so uh, just so I can figure out. One life, you could have been a monkey. Then you became cockroach. Now you're human. Also, also I want to know. I want everyone to know. There is a possibility next life you can become a, a very fat, overweight woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And you're okay with this? Yes, yeah, so I'm okay with this. Okay, good man. Good man. I just want to say. Now, is it a possible in India... If you're in India, that cow, that was your grandfather, the cow that's down the street. Can that be your grandfather? No, no grandfather, grandmother, because cow is a female. Oh, grandmother, okay. But hold on. How do you know maybe a man can come back as a cow? You mean in religion only women become cows? Can you remove this? Uh, yeah. uh, you yeah. have to be man, you have to be bull. Oh, okay. So, wait. So, I can understand what you believe. Only a woman can come back as a cow. Yeah. Can a cow then come back as a man? 
Uh, yeah. Okay, so is there a possibility that cow down the street, that's your grandmother? Mm, yeah, 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 possible. Okay, now the the uh, the pig. Is it possible that was your grandfather who's come back as a pig? Yes, possible. Okay. Sir. Oh. So now that cow, can it come back in the next lifetime as a man or has to come back as a woman? Uh, both possible. Okay. And, uh, so, I so I want to know if I understand your religion. If you're a woman, you can't come back as a cow, but a cow that was a woman can come back as a man. Can you smile when you say that? Smile. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, when it comes to cockroach, can a cockroach be a, a, in, a, a, in a previous life, a man and a woman, or only men become cockroaches? Okay. It can be both. Both, okay. All right. Now, as far as you're concerned, how many lives do you think you've lived? Like maybe 10 lives, 20 lives, or 30 lives? Uh, that's, I don't know, sir. Sorry. May Maybe 50, maybe? Oh, oh, okay, let's take it 50. Okay, so is it possible in those 50 lives, sometimes you were a cockroach, sometimes you were a, a rat, sometimes you were a pig, maybe sometimes a giraffe, then a monkey and a gorilla and a woman and a man, all possible? All possible, sir, all possible. Okay, okay that's it. So now, thank you. Maybe when my friend come back, maybe you can now listen, we're going to talk about chapter 3, verse 39. Okay, okay, no problem, no problem. And I hope though, my friend, I really hope, next life, you don't come back as a Muslim. Because if you come back as Muslim, that's worse than cockroach, worse yeah, than yeah. being a pig, right? You agree? Of course, of course. I, I know that, I agree with that. I pray you come back next life, you come back as a leopard. And then the life after that, you become tiger. And then from there, you become gorilla. I pray that for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We talk later. You're so nice. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Right, we talk. All right, brother. If you want to mute yourself, we're good. Okay. Anytime you want to call, I'm here, my friend. Uh, yeah, just one thing. Yes. Just, it just stuck my head. Okay. So I'm debating, you know, one of my friends who's a Seventh-day Adventist. She oh, keeps yes. on saying that the Sabbath is Saturday. It's Saturday. Okay, say so, all right, and it's Saturday, eh? And, and uh, why do you guys keep it on Sunday? Because as Christians who worship Jesus, who are born of the Spirit, who are spiritual Jews, we keep the true Sabbath. We keep the true Sabbath. Okay. You keep Israel Sabbath. You keep National Israel Sabbath. Okay, now guys, he's asked me a question about the Sabbath day. Let me now answer that question. I've answered it previously, but answer again. You guys want me to answer that question? When a seven-day Adventist tells you, why don't you keep the Sabbath day? It's part of the Ten Commandments. They'll say, you keep nine out of the Ten Commandments. Why don't you keep all of them? We do keep all of them. Let me answer the question. For Arthur, everyone else, as long as you're not bored, am I boring you with my discussion? Or is it blessing you, your understanding? Even though it's late for some of you, you're getting it by the power of the Spirit. My speech is clear by the power of the Holy Spirit because I'm here to serve you and I want to bore you and torture you. Now, yes. Now, here's your answer. Yes, we keep all Ten Commandments. Yes, we do keep the Sabbath. But here's what you do not say, because this is the mistake of Christians. The Sabbath was changed to Sunday. They'll say, no, it wasn't. So Catholics, Coptic, Assyrian Church of the East, Orthodox, please do not use this argument. Do not say, well, the Sabbath is now Sunday, it was changed to Sunday. Do you know why? Do you know why you don't use that argument? Can I tell you why? Do you know why? Because they'll tell you, show me in the New Testament, one verse in the New Testament that says, Sabbath has been changed to Sunday. We now worship on Sunday. You won't find it. It's not in the New Testament. It's not there. So if you go to the early church, they'll say, see, that's our point. You contradict the Bible. You go against the Bible and the example of the Jewish followers of Jesus who kept Sabbath. And you run to Gentiles who became more and more anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, right? To spite the Jews to prove your case. 
I'm going to show you how you prove your case. Catholics, Coptic, Assyrian Church of the East, Orthodox. I'm going to show you how you prove your case. Are you ready now? And no men. You know that same book of Acts says they also worshipped on Sabbath? They also observed the Sabbath? So you just buried yourself, no men. You know that, right? Just because the apostles are observing the Sabbath doesn't mean you as a Gentile keep the Sabbath. But that's your logic. Because if the apostles also gathered on the first day, no, see that? You're setting yourself up. You're setting yourself up. Okay? Danny, will your mother repent for giving birth to a demonic dog like you who's manifesting? Okay, are you now ready? Are you ready for the answer? Are you ready for the answer? Yeah. And Noah, Morris, you better show I'm wrong. Or I'm going to block you for being stupid enough to think that you're intelligent enough to show I'm wrong. Don't you love me, guys? I make you laugh. I make you cry, insult you. And then I encourage you and lift you up. All for free. You don't get charged. Right? Anyway, now, here's the answer. You say, we do keep the Sabbath. We do keep the Sabbath. But we don't keep... Israel's Sabbath, we keep God's Sabbath. What do you mean? Get them to admit that the Sabbath days of Israel and the Sabbath year was modeled after God's Sabbath day. Israel's Sabbath, their Sabbath, Sabbath days and Sabbath years, modeled after God's Sabbath. Where am I getting this from? Let's go now, Exodus 20, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. All right? Yep, he is. He's legion. Guys, pay attention now. Here's the answer. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it sacred. Why? You are to labor and do all your work for six days. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Jehovah your God. You must not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your slave, man, nor your slave girl, nor your domestic animal, nor your foreign resident who is inside your settlements, for in six days, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he began to rest on the seventh day. That is why Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and made it sacred. So you catch it? Your Sabbath days, Israel, and Sabbath years are modeled after my Sabbath day. My Sabbath day, which is the seventh day when I rested from my work of creation and entered my Sabbath day. Another one, Exodus 31. 12 to 17. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Only one way. Can you be patient, brother? Jehovah said further to Moses, Jehovah said further to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them, especially you are to keep my Sabbaths, plural, not one, for it is a sign between me and you during your generations, right? <clears throat> In order that you may know that I, Jehovah, am sanctifying you. You must keep the Sabbath. You must keep the Sabbath. For it is something holy to you. Whoever profanes it must be put to death. If anyone does any work on it, then that person must be cut off from among his people. Six days work may be done. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath of complete rest. It is something holy to Jehovah. Anyone doing work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. Now, notice 16. The Israelites must keep the Sabbath. They must observe the Sabbath during all their generations. It, it is a lasting covenant. Now, why? Because verse 17, guys, verse 17. It is an enduring sign between me and the people of Israel. For in six days, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and refreshed himself. Now, did everyone get it? Arthur, everyone. Yeah. Israel's Sabbath days and Sabbath years were modeled after God's Sabbath. So what is the true Sabbath day? God's Sabbath or Israel's Sabbath? What is the true original Sabbath day? God's Sabbath or Israel's Sabbath? God. God's, right? God's. Let's go to Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Guys, get ready and pay attention. If you get this argument, you're going to refute the Seventh-day Adventists. They don't have a way to refute you. Okay, Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. And by the seventh day, God had completed the work that he had been doing and began to rest on the Sabbath day, seventh day, from all his work that he had been doing. From all his work that he had been doing. 
And God went on to bless the seventh day and to declare it sacred, for on it God has been resting from all the work that he has created, all that he purposed to make. Now, guys, pay attention. Did you notice that in Genesis 1, each of the days had a morning and an evening? There was morning and evening, day one. There was morning and evening, day two. But for the Sabbath day, the seventh day, the Sabbath day, there was a beginning but no end. There was evening and morning, evening and morning, evening and morning for all the six days. But for the Sabbath day, seventh day, there was no evening and morning. God entered it, but it didn't end. In other words, according to the Bible, when God entered his Sabbath, his Sabbath has been ongoing till this day and will continue to be ongoing until the end of the age where Jesus ushers in a new heaven and new earth. Everyone got that? Yeah. Everyone understand that God's Sabbath is today. God's Sabbath will be tomorrow. God's Sabbath will be the day af after. Every day is God's Sabbath day because when he entered the Sabbath, it started and it's ongoing. When will it end? When Jesus comes and ushers in a new heaven and earth. That's when it ends. Everyone got I it? See. Yeah. Okay. So how does that apply to you and me? Let's go to Hebrews 4. Let's break it down. Verses 1 to 7 and then 8 to 11. Hebrews 4 verses 1 to 7, 8 to 11. Watch here. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 7. Therefore, since the promise of entering into his rest remains, God has promised, you must enter my rest, which is the word for Sabbath. Let us be on guard for fear. Someone among you seems to fall short of it, fails to enter God's rest. For we have also had the good news declared to us, just as they had, by the word that they heard, right? Right? But the word that they heard did not benefit them. Why didn't it benefit them? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So they didn't believe. They didn't believe the gospel was preached to them, so they didn't enter God's rest. So now it's a warning to us. Hey, don't be like them. Gospel's preached to you. You better believe so you enter his rest. Now watch. Now watch here. Verse 3. For we who have exercised faith do enter into the rest. Let me repeat, you have believed in Jesus Christ, are believing in Jesus Christ, you have entered God's rest the day you believed in him. Just as he has said, so I swore in my anger, they will not enter into my rest, although his works were finished from the founding of the world. So notice it's connecting God's rest with the Sabbath day after he finished creation. That's his rest that you enter by faith. Notice verse 4. For in one place he has said of the seventh day as follows, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now watch. And let's continue reading. Five. And here again he says, they will not enter into my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter into it, and those to whom the good news was first declared did not enter it because of disobedience, he again marks off a certain day by saying long afterward in David's psalm, today, just as it has been said alone, above, said above, today, just as it has been said above, today, today, if you listen to his voice, do not harden your hearts. Guys, did it sink in? The author of Hebrews, tradition as it was Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, God's rest is his Sabbath day. God's rest is the Sabbath day, which he entered into when he finished creation. And God is now inviting you and me, all of us, enter my rest. Come in my rest. Join me in my rest. Well, God, how do we enter? By believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, you enter. So when did you enter God's rest? Today, today when you hear the gospel, the day you hear the gospel, the day you believe, that is the day you enter and you remain in it and you stay in it till the end of the age. That's what Hebrews 4 just said. Now let's read 8 to 11. Four, Hebrews 4, verses 8 to 11. Miss Silva, I'm getting there. Miss Silva, be patient. I'm getting there. For if Joshua had led them into a place of rest, God would not afterward have spoken of another day. 
right? So now watch here, 9 to 11. So there remains the Sabbath rest for the people of God. Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the man who has entered into what? God's rest. God's rest. Has also rested from his own works, just as God did from his own. Let us therefore do our utmost to enter into that rest so that no one may fall into the same pattern of disobedience. There's your answer. We are observing the Sabbath. We do keep all Ten Commandments because we're observing the true Sabbath, God's Sabbath, not Israel's Sabbath. I'm a spiritual Jew, not an ethnic Jew. As a spiritual Jew, I observe God's Sabbath, which is the real Sabbath, and Israel's Sabbaths are nothing but shadows. So an ethnic Jew must become a spiritual Jew and enter God's true Sabbath. And the day you enter is the day you believe in the gospel and you remain in it. So today is Sabbath for me. Tomorrow is Sabbath for me. The day after. In other words, the moment you enter God's rest by faith in Christ, you are in the Sabbath every day until the end of the age, until Christ brings in a new heaven, new earth. Why do you think in Romans 14, Christians... Paul said, a person considers one day sacred. Someone else considers all of them sacred. To each his own, as long as you're doing it for Christ. Because Paul understood, we've now entered the true Sabbath. And that Sabbath is today and tomorrow and the next day until Jesus returns. Which is why, though we are now in God's Sabbath day, we can then set aside Sunday to honor Jesus who rose from the dead on Sunday while still observing the Sabbath every day. See, everything ties in and makes perfect sense. Right? Did it make sense? Yep, I got it. Now you know the answer, right? Yes. Praise the Lord, brother. Thank you, sir. Much Anytime, appreciated. Brother. And I'll do that session uh, for you, God willing, this week. Cool. Thank you. Take care, brother. Okay, take care. Amen. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you. Handsome young man. Sounds like Ravi Zacharias. Okay. Romans 14. What did Paul say? There are some Christians who think they have to keep one specific day. That's directed, I believe, to the Jews. And he goes, other Christians says, no, all days are the same. Because every day we worship Jesus. Every day we love Jesus. Every day we pray Jesus. And Paul says, you know what? To each his own. If you think every day is the same. Amen. But don't look down upon your brother who thinks one day is sacred. We need to set it apart. And if you think one day is sacred, then don't look down upon your brother who thinks all the days are the same because we worship and love Jesus every day and honor him every day. Don't condemn someone else who disagrees with you, but honor the Lord, right? Whether you want to set up one specific day or you consider all days to be the same. So in this view, we Christians are observing the Sabbath every day because we've entered the true Sabbath of God by faith in Christ. So I am a true Sabbath keeper. Not the seven-day Adventists who want to go back to the Jewish way of keeping the Jewish Sabbath. I'm keeping the true Sabbath. And I can still worship on Sunday. Because that's the day the Lord conquered death. And I honor the Lord who conquered death by observing that day in his honor with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Make sense now? According to Latter-day Saint doctrine and Joseph Smith, overwhelmingly, Jesus is the father of our salvation. So he's the father of our salvation. And because quote. of that, I'm, I'm continuing to answer, because of that, it makes all of those verses in context. You can find that all over the Book of Mormon. And no, actually, let's read some of it. Let's no, read, no, no, let's no, no, no. read some quote. of it that give talks about this differentiation between the father and the son. 3 Nephi 1923 says, And now, Father, I pray unto thee for them, and also for all those who shall believe on their words, that they may believe in me, that I may be in them as thou, Father, art in me. Yeah. The, I have that I in my discussion. Christ, Nephi, the Son of God, I created the heavens and the earth and all things that in them are. I was with the Father from the beginning. I am in the Father, and the Father in me. These verses give a now? lot of context on the sort of poetic language of Father, Son, Father, Son. But in great context, you can see more of these things. And that's important to understand if you want to have 
a discussion on the Book can, of Mormon, a divinity, and who control the heavens. Hold on, this guy won't let me answer his, his. He's giving his statements and preaching again. Can I answer you now? I actually have that in my paper showing the contradiction in the Book of Mormon because that's an example of the Trinity in the Book of Mormon. So you're not listening. You think you're listening to my case. You're only confirming my case. Even in what you cited, that's not a qualification, the qualification you made. That's why you keep saying Joseph Smith, Latter-day Saints. What you cited was a Trinitarian passage. It's in my file that I prepared to show that the Book of Mormon contradicts itself. Because in one place, Jesus is not the Father. I even said that in my opening speech. Other places, he is the Father. And at best, what you cited, even a modalist would quote that. Because that's simply mimicking... Yeah. This is the why high priestly prayer of Jesus. If you grab random verses, you can always pull them out of context. However, okay. if you read you them all in context, to so another, another, context. Great. So another one of those um, verses that you were describing um, is in 3 Nephi chapter 28. Um, mm -hmm. And so it says this. And for this cause, ye shall have a fullness of joy, and ye shall sit down in the kingdom of my Father. Yea, your joy shall be full, even as the Father hath given me fullness of joy, and ye shall be even as I am. And this is the Lord speaking to his disciples. Now, those words, ye shall sit down in the kingdom of my Father, yea, your joy shall be full, even as the Father hath given me fullness of joy. These are two very important things to juxtapose, because the fullness of joy and becoming like the Father is the same gift the Son gives to the people. Let's this make sure we're let's question. make sure we're asking yeah. qu let's make sure we're asking yeah, questions. Not, he, he's going into damage control mode because he knows there's yeah. one more insult till this is over. Yeah, one more insult until this is over. Let okay, let's let's you keep it. Let's, uh, come on, come on, come come on, on you guys. Come on, come on. You guys, let's 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 chill. I know I know we anti to answer the questions or anti to give a rebuttal, but we have to have a discourse, a conversation. Not only for YouTube, but also for the audience. The audience is complaining right now that you guys are talking about each other. Okay, yeah. you guys, so let's make sure that we don't go on a mono, uh, monologue. Let's make sure that we're dialoguing and we're asking questions. That's important. All right? Yeah, and Marlon, he hasn't. He's been going into these speeches because he's going to damage control. So let me address him because I quoted Third Nephi. Let me now quote Ether and show that he's not solving the tension and the contradiction. He's quoting one verse that smacks of Trinitarianism, but ignoring the other verses that smack of modalism. But in his mind, they're harmonious, and I'm not going to let him assume it's harmonious. He's going to have to prove it, and he hasn't. Now, let me read Ether, because I want everyone to hear what he said. Did you guys hear what he said? He's the father of our salvation. That's not what Ether said. Let me quote Ether chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of the heavens and of the earth, and all things that are in them are. The Father of the heavens and the earth and all things that are in them are. So yes, you can point to passages that seem to teach Trinitarianism, but you can point to other passages that smack of modalism, hence the contradiction. But then this contradicts later teaching that the Father was a man who became God, slept with one of his spirit wives, and sired Jesus because the citation gave you from the Book of Mormon. Hey, Sam. God has been God. Hey, Sam, so, I just, Sam, I just need Quake who... Uh... I think he just left. Uh, I think okay. he just. I think he just left. Um, it's alright. Let him leave, bro. It's okay, bro. It's let all me right. see. It's okay. If he leaves, he leaves, bro. It's fine. Like I said, he's too young. He's not ready. Anyway, that's okay, brother. Hey, man, this is gonna be good. It's gonna blow up your channel. I promise you. Let me see. Hold on one second. Don't be, hey, Marlon, brother. Don't be disappointed. This is going to be a blessing to you, man. It won't blow up your channel. <laughs> I promise you. I really it want. I really wanted the discussion on Sam. <laughs> I know. I wanted it too. But you see, he oh, got nervous. Man. He got nervous. But he kept going into speeches because he wasn't prepared for the honest. Honestly, he wasn't. Sorry, brother. It's okay. Uh, Make that prediction for him. Oh man, quick! Who did you leave? I'm trying to get yeah, back yeah. in contact with him to see. Uh, See if I can get him back, man. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I hope it doesn't devolve into just we talking because it's going to be a waste of time, brother. Sorry. Maybe you can get a bona fide, qualified Mormon scholar, not a young man. Because I know he's popular, but he's not qualified. And I'm not saying this, put him down. He's a young man. He's overzealous. And he's not qualified. Maybe if you want to get contact like a bona fide Mormon scholar, I'd love to do this. Uh, man. <laughs> Bro, I promise you, it's going to go viral. You don't understand how social media works. Wow, quick rant, and you're gonna get like 10 million views. It's not <laughs> I promise you. Oh man, oh man. It's okay, bro. We had a yeah, good time. He, he dipped. Uh, he got. He, he got out of dodge. 
He got out of Dodge big time, man. Oh, yeah, man. Please don't take it down. Please don't take it down. Leave us on. Now, it'll stay up, but it's just, dang, I really wanted the conversation, though, Sam. You know, I, re- I really wanted it, man. Um, well, you know, I guess that's how some Boy, of it goes, God, man. man. Hey, brother, that's what happens when you prop a false prophet and blaspheme the trying God. Our God lives. You know yeah. that, my brother. Yeah, yeah. I love you, man. That's, I love you too, man. That's the truth. <laughs> hey, you oh, know, man. I don't know why people want to debate God. I'm not boasting. God crucified my flesh because I take no prisoners for the glory of the trying God. Honestly, I don't. Mm. Because this is, brother, you and I know, this is lives at stake. It's not a game. People's salvation is at stake. We're going yeah. to have to give an account for the blood of many. This is why I take it seriously with a passion. And by the grace of God, you and me, I know you can amen this, we're willing to die for Jesus, the mm. true Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah. it's not a joke. We're not we're, we're this is about people's everlasting salvation. So Yeah, yeah he left though. He left and yeah, okay, he's he, he's not responding, so no, he's done. He's done. Yeah, That's okay, he's, bro. But I love he's you, man. Done. He's probably done. I love you, man. It's all good, man. It's all good. It's all good. Sorry, folks. I don't know what to tell y'all, uh, but it's all good, man. And, um, you know, this is probably my first one on a show where somebody just cut the cord in the middle of the debate. This is the first. So um, this is interesting, man. Very interesting. So he's not cut. Maybe can I riffle some? Yeah, give me one. I know what. My... Go ahead. We'll deal with them. Yeah. But give me one. Um, me one. Let's sure. take, for example, John 14, 28. Oh, that one's beautiful. The father is greater than I. I know you're doing Chef Google. Do you know the context? Bring up John 14. <laughs> no. Have you read the context? I mean, you went to Chef Google. Oh, the whole thing. No, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know the context actually. Okay. Now let's read John 14, 28. Now let's see. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the father for the father is greater than I. Okay. So you're thinking that Jesus is saying he's not God because the father is greater than him? Yes. Okay, well, you, you'd be wrong, and I'll explain why. I'm going to show you from the context why you're wrong. But you have to be honest with me and answer. Is your boss greater than you? Yes. Say it again. I mean, from authority, I guess, oh, yes. Yeah. You answered it. So you just realized someone can be greater than you, either in authority or in nature. Now, are you greater than your dog? I mean, I guess different. I, it depends on what sense. In the I sense mean, that the, in the eyes of your God, do you have more value than your dog or you're less than a dog in the eyes of your God? Oh, in that sense, yes. Okay, so notice your boss is greater than you in authority, but not in nature. Authority. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. But you're greater than your dog in nature. Now, the question is, is Jesus saying, my father is greater than I in nature or in authority? You don't need to guess because the chapter doesn't begin in John 14, 28. Now, I'm going to show you what Jesus says. Now, isn't it true? In Islam, in the Quran, according to the names of Allah, Al-Asma wa Sifat, one of the 99 names of Allah is Al-Haq, the truth? I believe so, yes. Okay. And you agree, if you're a Muslim, you cannot give the unique names and attributes of Allah to a creature that would be shirk. We agree? Um, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, well, um, that's Islam. Because I'm now going to go John 14, 6. Now, let's read context. I'm going to read context. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth, Al-Haq, and the life, Al-Hayat. According to the Old Testament and even the Quran, only God is the life and he alone is the truth. This is why you'll never find anywhere in your Quran where anyone besides Allah is said to be the truth or the life. So here Jesus said, I am the truth and the life. Now, can you show me Anywhere in your Quran or in the Old Testament, a prophet saying, I am the truth and the life? Um, Probably could not. You can't because no prophet says it. So number one, Jesus just claimed the very qualities, names of God. I am the truth and the life. He didn't say, I will reveal the truth. No, I am the truth. I will point to it. No, I am the life. That's number one. Number two, you agree because we have this in common. You are to pray to Allah, and Allah alone answers prayers, right? Yes. Okay, go to John 14, 13 or 14. Now watch here. This is Jesus, same chapter. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 
If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus said, he'll be in heaven. You will then pray to him in his authority, and he from heaven will answer your prayers. Can you show me a prophet? Show me a prophet that says, I will answer your prayers, and I will do what you ask me. No. So if Jesus is a creature and he's just a man, why does he say, I am the life, I am the truth, and you pray to me, and I from heaven will answer all your prayers and do all the miracles if he's a creature, when he knows these are things that only God can do? Um, I think I get your point. But, okay, um, let me do one more, and then I'll let you ask you the next question. John 14, 23. Okay, watch here. Now, Jesus says he's equal to the Father. Watch here. John 14, 23. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we, plural, I and the Father, will come to him and make our home. I and the Father will live with all believers at the same time. Now, can a creature say, whoever loves me and obeys me, I will live with all of them at the same time? Can Muhammad say that? I will live. Yeah, that's what it says. Live meaning he will be with you in your home and be with all Muslims at the same time. Um, I guess that was, I mean, you were talking about Muhammad. That was not the his intention, but um, I guess to, to short answer is no. Okay, but Jesus said, I and my father, we live with every true believer, no matter how many, no matter where they're at. I am with all of them. The same way the father is. So that means he's claiming to be equal to the father. That he has the same ability the father has to be with all believers at the same time. Does this sound like he's a creature? Does he sound like he thinks he's equal to the father? Be honest. I get the interpretation now okay. how this can be understood as um, Good. Um, him being equal. Um, still, now I have some verse. problem with it. So go ahead. If you have another verse, go ahead. Um um i mean let's stick to this one okay. uh because i still have some problems with it, with it because for, in, the sure. in the beginning you mentioned the. Uh, can you hear me yeah so go ahead yeah what's the problem okay. you... so in the beginning in the beginning of your explanation you mentioned um um jesus being inferior in authority as the father right yeah okay would it what's the problem? imply that it yeah he has a different will no, it applies that he's not the same person. Does not imply the different will then? No, it applies that he's not the same person. Because you're um, confusing authority with will. Because if Jesus' will is contrary to the Father, then that means he wouldn't be in perfect union with the Father and do all that the Father tells him to do. No, it only implies that he's not the same person as the Father. Okay. Then let, let's me bring up another verse. Yes, go with another verse. I like you. You're very honest. I like that. Right. Oh, um, I think it was, yes, um, Matthew 36, 39. So I believe uh, in this, and I think it's this kind of the same in um, Mark 14. 36? 36 and Luke yeah, that's Matthew 26, where he prays to the Father. Abba, Father. Exactly, exactly. And... Um, and if I remember the context correctly, um, it's like moments before crucifixion. Yep. And um, the night before he's betrayed, yes. And um, um, he sees that coming. And uh, this verse seems to indicate that um, he would like it not mm -hmm. to happen, but sure. lives in the hands of the Father. Okay, so what's the question? I know the verse that's in front of me, but what is it? What's the question? So this verse would indicate some, I mean, to me at least, uh, different will. Oh, I mean, no, Jesus not necessarily. What the Father wants. No, not necessarily. I don't want to make it technical for you because this is uh, advanced Christian. No, it actually shows that his will is not different from the Father because he says, not as I will, but as you will, because the Son's will is the Father's will. So that's your misreading it. Indeed, but then why is he asking them to... to um, because he's not the uh, same person as the Father. Pass. Yes, because, no, you're, you just read it. Read it carefully. Let's read it carefully. If it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as he will. So he's even showing that if there's another way of salvation, let it be. However, 
my will is your will. So if there's no other way, then he will accept the cup. That's why in 42, what does it say? Read 42. Okay, watch uh, it. I don't, I mean, I'm going to read it for you. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. That's actually showing you that his will is the father's will because that's what he does. So he's asking if it's within the will of the father for this cup to pass away. If not, your will be done because the son's will is the father's will. He comes to do what the father sends him to do. Free will, predestination. Excellent question. Wow. I told you, uh, if you're going to give you answers you may not like, you may like them. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my journey. And I don't want to offend any of my brothers and sisters who may not like that I've changed. I used to be a five-point Calvinist. Okay. I used to be. Okay. I don't want to offend anyone who is. I'm no longer a Calvinist. And I believe it's because the weight of Scripture made me change my position. I understand. And I don't want people or Calvinists to think I'm saying that you're not Christians. I'm saying in my journey, my understanding, I've changed. So when you ask me about predestination free will, what exactly are you asking me about predestination? Are you asking me, has God predestined everything everyone does within yeah. time and space? Yeah. Are you asking me... Salvation. Salvation, okay. So even that... So, and I'm not trying to skirt the answer because that question needs a little unpacking. Are you asking me, has God predestined those who will be saved? Yes. And when you ask me that, do you really mean... God has already chosen before creation who will be saved and who won't. In other words, God has created you yes. to be saved through faith in Christ, but He's created him to hand him over to desires of his heart and then damn him accordingly. Is that what you're asking me? Pretty much. All right. If you read the totality of Scripture, right. God truly desires the salvation of every human creature. Right. You can't get around that. See, these were the things that as a Calvinist I struggled with. Right. I struggled with. I'll give you a couple examples. Right. So we can be here all night talking about this. It's up to you guys. Because this is a very, and I'm treading lightly, not because I don't want to answer, but it's not a yes or no. I have to unpack it. Yeah. I've been spending 50 years trying to figure it out. Brother, we're going to be spending thousands of years still trying to figure it out. <laughs> That's true. You're not, believe me, we're not going to figure it out. But I can tell you with absolute certainty on the basis of Scripture, God desires the salvation of even those who end up rejecting Him and going to hell. Right. And from the depth of His being, He desired their salvation. And I'm not saying this because I want to tickle people's ears. If I was in a church, they're all Calvinists, I would say the same thing. Right. Right? And then you'd have those Calvinists who tell you, well, that's the two wills of God. In certain Calvinist understanding, God has two wills. What He decrees, what He has determined, and what He desires. He may desire the salvation of everyone, but he's only decreed the salvation of the elect. They call this the two wills in God. You'll hear some prominent Calvinists mention this, like John Piper. You heard John Piper? Yeah. Yeah. John MacArthur. Yeah. They talk about the two wills of God. What God desires and what he's decreed. So he desires the salvation of a Judas, but he's decreed the damnation of Judas. And they go, we don't understand how it works. Now, if that's biblical, I'm okay with not understanding how God works. But let me give you some passages that troubled me, that... Jesus, remember I said he's the God of truth. He can't lie. Because he can't lie, he's not play acting. So go to Luke 19, 41 to 44. Now here's where the King James Bible will do you a favor in certain passages. And I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Excellent question. Excellent question. And this is going to be a debate until the Lord comes because we're dealing with an infinite mind and how that infinite mind relates to creation and time. Mm -hmm. You get two Christians, you're going to get 50,000 opinions. Because you're dealing with an infinite mind, right? I mean, imagine you want to take an entire body of water and put it in this cup. Is that going to be possible? Right? So you are that cup and God is that huge ocean and trying to fit him into your brain. Ain't going to happen. His ways are higher than our ways. So it's not that God doesn't want you to understand. Even if He wanted you, there are certain things God cannot do. And that's not irreverent. There are certain things God cannot do. He cannot lie. Right? He cannot disown Himself. Right? He cannot tempt you with evil. So God cannot take a finite creature and make Him infinite. It doesn't happen. Right? So even if God wanted you to... You, you're a creature. By your very nature, you're limited. And you cannot contain the infinite. And even that needs to find it. But anyway, Luke 19, 41-44. 
Luke 19, 41 and 44. Notice the heart of Jesus towards Jerusalem that he's now going to allow to be destroyed by the Romans. Notice his heart. Whoever wants to read it. Luke 19, 41 and 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying... He not, wept, huh? Yeah. So now before you move on, you got to read it slowly so it can simmer. Was he play acting? Were these genuine tears from his heart? Of course you're going to say, because to say he's play acting, that's blasphemy. So here is the human face of God shedding human tears because his heart is broken. But why is his heart broken? Keep reading. Saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now notice two factors here. First he says, if you only knew what made for your peace. So Jesus came to destroy or to grant them peace? Grant them peace, right? And then 44 he says, but you've left me no choice, and the time is coming. Your enemies will embank, make an embankment around you, dash you and children, to the ground and leave not one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. What in the world does that mean? Well, you don't need to guess. Luke has already told you what it means, visitation. Go to Luke 1 and read 67 to 69 and pay attention to verse 68. Luke 1, 67 to 69. What does it mean, the time of your visitation? Luke will explain. This is the beauty of Scripture. The author will explain the things he's written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you don't need to guess. You don't need Sam Shimon's commentary. But if I do write a commentary, I expect every one of you to buy multiple copies. <laughs> no, Luke 1, 67 to 69. Whoever's there, please read. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. So understand this is the utterance from the Holy Spirit, right? That's why I had you start at 67. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit, so it's the Holy Spirit who's moving him to utter these words. These are the words the Holy Spirit is moving Zechariah to utter. It's not his fallible, imperfect opinion. Okay, just keep that in mind. Keep reading. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn. Of Your translation did not translate. I'll read it. Visited. He has visited his people. Praise be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited That's and the word. redeemed his people. What translation are you reading? Um, the NIV. The, the, the not inspired version. <laughs> also called the New England. Now, uh, NIV, work your way away from the NIV. Okay. I'm being, I'm being honest. Say it again. It's got all my markings. Yeah, that's yeah, but that's the whole problem. See, one thing a translation is not just a translation is an interpretation. At times, you need to interpret, not just translate, literally. Because if I translate literally, you're going to lose the meaning. But there are times in which the NIV has translated in a way that's more of a paraphrase that was unnecessary. For example, when your translation said, the Lord God has come, you didn't see any connection between what was said there and with what Jesus said. So you lost the connection. Unless you're reading it in the Greek, right? But that's why you want a translation so you don't go to the original languages. Because they need to go to seminary and you know, be in debt up to your eyeballs to learn the languages. So notice his translation. Read it one more time, Luke 168. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So why did the Lord God visit his people? To do what? Destroy them or redeem them? To redeem them. So when Jesus said, you did not recognize the time of your visitation, what is he referring to? That I am the Lord God who has come to visit you to save you. See the connection? So what was Jesus' desire? To save Jerusalem and all her inhabitants. But because you rejected me, now you've left me no choice but allow you to be destroyed. This is why the wording is important. So what is the time of visitation, Jesus? That God has come to visit His people with salvation, not destruction. So why did you end up destroying them? Because they refused to accept me. So it wasn't your will to destroy them. No, my will was to save every one of them. So why did they end up destroying Because they rejected me. You see where I'm going with this? So free will. We'll get there. So far. Yes. No, so we'll get there. Yeah, no, and again, yes. Uh, it, well, I'll explain how the Bible works. It just, you remember, like I said, the, the question he asked me, I can't answer in one minute. 
I can't answer. If you really want me to do justice to this question, I gotta unfold it, right? In fact, it would even take series of lessons, not just one or two. I'm gonna do my best with the four and a half hours a lot of time. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, now, that was 168, but now go to 169. Read in your translation. Go, continue 169. And he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Horn is a metaphor in the Bible referring to a king with sovereign power. He's raised up a king from whose house? David. To do what? S salvation. Who is that king from the house of David that's come to save? Jesus. Right. That's why I go to read Luke 2.11 to see it's Jesus. They don't stop texting. <laughs> but anyway, it happens. Luke 2, when you're on social media, you won't get the yeah, Luke 2.11. Who is the horn, the king from the house of David that comes to save, not destroy? Comes to save, not condemn. Luke 2.11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So God sent His Son... To be born of the seed of David to destroy Jerusalem or to save it? Save salvation. Do you see why Jesus was crying now? Do you see his heart? He started weeping. Because I had come to save you, but because you didn't recognize who I am, but oppose me, you leave me no choice, but give you what you deserve. So this is the heart of God. This is God's heart for even those who are destroyed. His heart was, I didn't come to destroy you, I came to save you. So the Lord did everything in His power and goodness to convince them. They persisted in their rebellion, leaving Him no choice but to hand them over, justifiably so, to destruction. But to make it even more plainer that He came to save them, that was His desire. Same chapter, Luke, Luke chapter 1, verses 76 to 77. Read what it says there. Now, Zechariah is prophesying over his son, John the Baptist, because John the Baptist is born, the forerunner of Jesus. So now he's going to prophesy over his son, John. You, John, my son, you were created for this purpose. For what purpose? Read. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. So what is he going to tell the people? The Savior has come. And he's come to save you from your sins by believing in him. And who's the Savior? Jesus Christ. So it's quite clear in the context of Luke, the intention and the purpose of Jesus was to save Jerusalem as a whole. Everyone, even those that end up getting destroyed. Now let me shock you a little further. Jesus also came to save Judas. Now some of you are shocked. Good, because a lot of people get shocked. What? Yeah. Okay, let me show you what Jesus says to Judas. You who follow me, will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Does that include Judas? Okay. But Jesus knew Judas would betray him, and Jesus, Jesus knew that Judas would be destroyed. However, though Jesus knew it, Jesus is showing his intention and his heart. My heart for you, Judas, is salvation, not destruction. And I have all this in store for you, if you only believe. Let me give you a couple more. Go to Matthew 10, verses 1 all the way to 8. Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. I want you to see, not only was Judas promised a throne, Judas was given the same power to do the same miracles that the others did. Judas, like the rest, raised the dead. Judas, like the rest, gave sight to the blind. Judas, like the rest, cast out demons. Judas, like the rest, preached the gospel and got people saved. It's right there, Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. You'll see it. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Eleven of disciples? No, all twelve. Judas too? Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Keep going. To cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So even Judas, huh? Yeah. And so what did Judas do? Keep reading, all the way to eight. These twelve, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, Wait, cast out Judas demons. is going to, you're reading like, you're, you're really fast, like yeah. you want to get raptured and leave us behind. Don't worry about it. No, <laughs> There's a rapture all going together for safe, so no rush. <laughs> Slowly. What is Judas going to do? Heal what? Heal the sick, raise the dead. So Judas was going to raise the dead. Yeah. Someone whom the Lord knew would betray him would belong to the devil. Keep reading. Cleanse leopards, cast out demons, you received without paying, give without paying. Mm. So, Judas was given the same authority to do the same miracles and was given the same promise to reign over Israel that the rest were, right? It's going to get a little better or worse depending on your theological belief. Go to Luke 10, 17 to 20. 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your Now, does that include Judas or no? That would include Judas, right? All right, keep going. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and, on all, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Okay, whose names are written in heaven? Whose names are written in heaven? The 72? the 72 that went out. Okay. Judas went out, went out too? Yes, sir. So his name is written in heaven? I never thought of it. Before. Exactly. I mean, and I say that because clearly Jesus is showing his intention for Judas. You will sit on one of the twelve thrones. I've given you power over demons. They're subject to you, and your name is written in heaven. See, in the Bible, names are erased. In other words, if you read the Bible contextually, which I'm about to do, every human creature that exists, his name is written. It's when a person falls away that the names are erased. Go to Revelation 3, verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book. That's a promise to who? The one who conquers, right? So if you conquer, not only will you be given a right robe, but I won't blot out your name. Right. Therefore, if you fail to conquer, what happens? You don't need to guess. Go to Exodus 32, 32 to 33, where God makes it explicit. Exodus 32, 32 to 33. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which yeah. thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So you caught it? He blots out those who sin and turn away. So if I read contextually, Judas's name is in the book. Judas is one of those who will sit on one of the twelve thrones. And Judas is given power to cast out demons, raise the dead, all of which displays Jesus' genuine love for Judas. But it's going to get even more explicit in Luke 22, 19 and 23. Luke 22, 19 and 23. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, before you move on, does he exclude anyone in what he just said? No. This bread is my body broken for you. Does he say some of you, most of you, but not all of you? He's and then in verse 20, one more time. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Some of you, most of you, but not all of you? Not all of you. But now notice who's included. Now read 21 to 23. But behold... The hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So when Jesus said, this bread represents my body broken for all of you, and this cup is the new cup of my blood shed for you, was Judas there? Of course not. And he included Judas in that saying? So Jesus saying to Judas, I'm even dying for you, and this is how you repay me. Now, one more final passage on this. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. So there you go. It's blotting out those whose names are in. And why are they being blotted out? Why are the names being blotted out? They're not. 
Consider it because of their right. persistent rebellion and rejecting the truth, right? Mm -hmm. So why did I bring up Judas? Because Judas represents Jesus' heart for all of Jerusalem. And not just for all of Jerusalem, but all creation. That God's desire is to save every creature that He's created. <clears throat> and God has done everything to show His love for every creature. But when someone persists in rebellion and turns away, then God is justified in handing them over to destruction. So when I used to be a Calvinist, I used to believe, this was my teaching, what I was taught, because there are varieties of Calvinism. You have some Calvinists who are four-point four Calvinists, and then you have those Calvinists who believe there are two wills in God. I was one of those taught that Jesus only died for the elect, no more, no less. That's all he died for. And he came to save only the elect, no more, no less. And the elect will then be regenerated by the Spirit, and enabled to believe in Christ so that those whom Jesus dies for will be saved because they'll definitely turn to Christ. This is what I was taught. It's these passages that made me start questioning first limited atonement. Then it started making me question what we call irresistible grace. And then it started making me question. See, I was told that if you reject one link, it's inevitable you're going to reject all of them. I didn't think so. I said, I'll be okay. I can reject limited atonement. I'll still believe. But the more I started thinking about it, I go, yeah, they're right. When one goes, they all go. Now, this is my journey. This may not be your journey. This is my journey. But when they keep talking, because I've already, I used to argue these arguments. I already know where they're coming from. I know about Acts 1 and Matthias. I know they're going to say, well, Jesus had Matthias in mind. What Jesus had in mind and what his audience understood, it's two different things. And you can't reject the contextual meaning, what Jesus is conveying to those people on the basis of the omniscience of Christ. Because then we can play that game all day, all night with many passages of the Bible. Many. One classic text that I use as, as a ground to see if people are thinking exegetically or eisegetically. I have them explain to me John 3, 5. And I want to give this as an example because I know where the brothers are coming from. And I was trying to address it without trying to be argumentative. But sometimes you can't avoid it. You have to argue, but that's okay. Sharpen, iron sharpens iron. Now, in John 3, 5, this will be a test of our ability to think exegetically or eisegetically, where we impose a tradition onto the text or let the text speak clearly in its historical contextual context. You have to first understand what a passage means in its own context and see how it applies later on. You have to do this, otherwise... You're making the Bible fit your theology as opposed to changing your theology to agree with the Bible. And we're all guilty of that to some extent. I'm guilty of it. When I say the prayer should be, Holy Spirit, sanctify me. Show me where I'm wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think there's anyone on this side of glory that understands the Bible perfectly and is not reading the Bible eisegetically in some extent. We all do it to some extent. Sadly, we're not aware of it. Because if we were, we wouldn't do it. Right? <laughs> Right? If I knew I'm eisegeting it, do you think I want to eisegete it unless I'm of the devil? Because that's what Satan does. He eisegetes. And he does it knowingly and willfully. Okay, so this is going to be a test how you read the Bible. If you read it fairly, historically, contextually, to see what these words meant to the people that Jesus is talking to. And don't brush it aside to omniscience. That's not going to work. Because Jesus is trying to communicate clearly to the people hearing him. And then we see how it applies to us later on. John 3, 5, after Nicodemus is baffled when Jesus says, you must be born again, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, in verse 5, what does it say? Who wants to read it? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This will be a test of whether you eisegete or you exegete. What does it mean, water and spirit? Now, I can give you the interpretations given historically. Here, water means the water of the word. That when you hear the word, it cleanses you. And some will go to John 15, verse 3. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Or in Ephesians 5, 26. The washing of the water of the word. Ephesians 5, 26. Okay, that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that it's referring to natural birth, the water of the womb. Why? Because in verse 4, what does he say? Must I enter my mother's womb a second time? So he understood it to mean natural birth. But then in verse 6, Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, right? Spirit. So, oh, see, natural birth. Okay, that's the second meaning. The third meaning is that when it says water and spirit, that word and gets a little tricky in the Greek. And get any commentary to confirm this. The word and doesn't always mean and. It can mean even. The water, even the spirit, meaning the water that is the spirit. So that water here means the spirit. 
It's simply two ways of speaking of being born of the Spirit. Now, where do they get that from? Because in John 7, 38 to 39, in John 7, 38 to 39, Jesus says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then 39, John says, of this he spake of the Spirit. So you see water, that is the Spirit. Now there's a fourth interpretation. Water, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the four interpretations. Contextually, what interpretation makes sense of the context historically? If you tell me water here means being cleansed by the word, you'd have to show me Nicodemus understood it because Jesus is trying to make it clear to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Don't pass it off on God's omniscience because Jesus is trying to tell him, this is what you must do. To then not explain how to do it means he's left in the dark about how to be born again. So would he have understood it to mean the water of the word? How? Jesus never mentioned anything about the word cleansing you. Right? Okay. Right. The strongest, the se I would say the second strong is natural birth. Why? Because before and after he talks about birth, right? right. Okay, but I'm going to show you one that's even stronger. And this is the unanimous interpretation of the early church, by the way. Let me shock some of you. If you go and read the writings of the church fathers, don't take my word for it. Please do not take my word for it. Do not. Thank God for Chef Google. Google, the greatest scholar who's ever existed. Google.com will get all the answers on Google. The greatest living scholar of the 21st century. You type in John 3, 5, early church fathers. You will find from the epistle of Barnabas to Irenaeus to Justin Martyr and on and on it goes. Every one of them, when they spoke about John 3, 5, they understood water to mean water baptism, without exception. I'm going to tell you why that's important in a minute. I'll tell you that why it's important in a minute. But let's go contextually. How many of you are aware that Jesus used to baptize people in water before his death and resurrection? How many of you are aware that Jesus actually had his disciples immerse people in water, in a body of water? Where do we find that? Right here, right after he finishes telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit. Because notice in verse 22, after he finishes the conversation, what does Jesus do? Chapter 7 or 8? No, John 3, 22. Right after he says, you must be born of water and spirit, the only gospel writer to mention, Jesus started baptizing people in water. Coincidence? John 3, 22. Someone read it for me. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he carried with them and baptized. He baptized, huh? And just so you don't have any doubt it's water, they go to John the Baptist. If you continue reading, they go to John, hey, the man that you're talking about, everyone's going to him to be baptized. And that's when John says, well, I'm just a friend. He is the bridegroom. He must increase. I must decrease. And then it's, you still don't get that Jesus is baptizing people. Read 26. 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to him thou bearest witness. Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And if they're talking to John, who's baptizing in water, guess what kind of baptism Jesus is doing? In water. Water baptism. And if you still don't get it, John 4, verses 1 and 2. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Through the agency of the disciples. So, is it a coincidence after telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit, he starts baptizing people in water through the agency of his disciples? Or is John, the author, wants you to make a connection and see Jesus' meaning? See, if you are stuck to a tradition, you're going to read it isogetically. You know, it can't mean water baptism because my tradition says water baptism doesn't regenerate. Well, that's good for your tradition. I'm dealing with exegesis. My allegiance isn't to your tradition, it's to interpreting the Bible correctly. So convince me exegetically that it's not water baptism. Historically, contextually, exegetically. I agree with you, but I've heard people say, well, what about the thief that was on the, Christ, on the cross and he says, today sure. you will be with me in paradise. I actually did a session because, let's think logically. Do you really expect someone who's got spikes in his hands to then someone say, hey! Get him off right now and dip him in water, dude, or he's not going to heaven. That's right. exactly. That is one of the worst examples of it because Jesus Christ, who's God, 
can grant anyone salvation any manner he, he sees fit. You're talking about an exceptional case. Someone who not only didn't get baptized, who didn't even go to church, who didn't study the Bible, who didn't take communion. So is he the norm? Is that the person we look to as the normal way of doing things? Or is that an exception to show you that the grace of God is so vast that he can even save you in the last seconds of your life? But ask me a better question. What if that man survived? Would he have then been obligated to get baptized? Based on what you're showing us, yes. It has to be, because what did the Lord say? The Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So would he have been a good Christian in good standing if he survived the, the, the crucifixion and went on his merry way and didn't get baptized? See, this is another thing. We take what are exceptions to the norm and ignore, ignore the normal way of doing things. I, and I can, like I said, I can do this with any example. Hebrews 9.27, we're told, it is appointed for men to die once. And after that comes a judgment. But then Hebrews 11.5 says, Enoch didn't die. Well, hold on, Hebrews. You told me it's appointed for men to die once. Enoch didn't die. Lazarus died, was raised to die again. That's twice. So come on, get your facts straight, Hebrews. You, you with me there? You don't look at the exceptions and then derive your doctrine. You look at the norm. The normal pattern of how God deals with people. And that's how you derive your doctrine. Because if we go with exceptions, I can do that with essentially every doctrine that you take for granted. I can look to those scanty references out of context, in isolation, and disprove many things you believe. I can do that with the deity of Christ. I can do that with the Trinity. I, I mean, I, we, there's no stopping this method. This is why I said John 3, 5 will be a test study of whether you exegete or you eisegete. But someone had their hand raised? Yeah, I, so so uh, Matthew 7, 21. Uh, Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, yes. shall I enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father is in heaven. Yes, precisely. He was referring to Judas one as one. Yes, because Judas yes. did miracles. Right. Judas cast out demons, right? right? He did everything right. Jesus said those people would do. But one thing Judas did not do, he did not obey the commands of the Lord. And how does it apply to today? So far, yeah. You, have, you can have people who can preach like me. Right. Now, I don't raise the dead yet. I don't know, but maybe we can try. Maybe someone, you want, you want to be? Maybe you drop dead. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I can be preaching all day, all night, but if I'm not striving to live in obedience to the will of God, then I am a Judas. Mm. Because Jesus tells you how you know a true Christian from a false one. It's right there in Matthew 7, 23. I will tell them plainly, <clears throat> I never knew you. Depart from me. You lawless ones. Now the word is interesting. It's anomian. It means without law. A negation nomos. Meaning you who rejected my law. See, we don't emphasize enough in the church. And we don't. And I, I'm not attacking. I'm just being honest. The necessity to obedience to God's law. Amen. People will tell you, well, Moses gave the law. Jesus gave grace. You know, I'm saved by grace, not by law. Well, that confuses two issues. They weren't saved by law either. In the Old Testament, no one was saved by the law. They were saved by grace. And in the New Testament, though you're saved by grace, you're saved unto obedience to the law of Christ. You have a law that you're supposed to obey. It's called the law of Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians 9, 21. So I didn't mean to go a far drift. I didn't do it justice to the answer about predestination. But I did want to emphasize, however, whatever... If you have predestination, you cannot deny God's heart that He wants to save every creature in existence. And I'm going to go back to one more passage to really, you think this is controversial? If I go to this passage, you guys are going to start stoning me. These two brothers are about to headbutt me. When I'm done, they're going to start stoning me. <laughs> Get them out of here, this guy, man. Alex, you're, you're disfellowshipped. Dang. But the will of the Father is that everyone would know Him. Therefore, it's yes. responsibility according to His law yes. is to go out and tell everyone... Yes, you have to. Yeah. I'll prove that to you, that God's will, because you can't have Jesus' will in conflict with the Father's will, or conflict with the Spirit. Then you don't have a trinity. You have three separate gods in conflict. The Father's will is in perfect union with the Son's will and the Spirit's will. That's why, if you remember what He said about the Spirit, let me remind you what He said about the Spirit. He will not speak on His own initiative. He will only speak what he hears. That was John 16, 13. The members of the Godhead are in perfect, inseparable union. They always do all things in perfect union. They're never in competition or opposition. So if it's Jesus' will for Judas to be saved, guess whose will that was as well? 
fathers. The Father and the Spirit. Unless there's a conflict of will within the Godhead. Well, then you destroy the integrity of the Godhead. And I don't think anyone wants to go that far. But let's just read 1 Corinthians 9, 21. One wants to, read to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So we do have a law. It's called the law of Christ. And that's in Galatians 6, verse 2, by the way. Galatians 6, verse 2. So you Christians have been saved to obedience to the law of Christ. Well, what is that law? That's why I have 27 books of instruction. Galatians 6, verse 2. Hmm. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So Christians, grace doesn't exclude or do away with the law. Grace results in the empowerment to obey the law. The law of Christ. And if you ask me what it is, that's why you have 27 books of instruction. That's the law of Christ. So what's the criterion that Jesus gives there to know a true Christian or a false one? Are you obeying the law? What law? Not the Mosaic law, the law of Christ and his fulfillment of the Mosaic law. Huh? No, I'm, I'm just giving you scripture. Right, are you saying it? So that's the criterion. But now, as far as predestination, and I don't want to keep belaboring it because I want to give people opportunity. Uh, because again, I can be here all day on predestination. This is why I'm trying to know how much to say in a way that will put you on a journey to think more deeply about the, about, about the subject. It, it, you see irrefutable proof God wants every creature to be saved. Now I'm going to show you a passage. I actually debated a colleague of mine, Matt Slick. He's a five-point Calvinist. I love him. He's a dear brother in the Lord. We debate on limited atonements online. Got heated because he's like me. You know, when, you know, when you're a Calvinist and you're Middle Eastern, then you really got issues because then you're super angry, right? No, I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But anyway, we, we, it got heated, but it was respectful because I really love Matt Slick. I consider him a brother in the Lord. I know he's not too glad that I left Calvinism. Well, we debated on limited atonement. We debated on the topic. I'll let you watch the debate and you come to your own conclusion. I brought up Colossians 1, and one thing I did not like is how they try to manipulate my exegesis in order to portray me in a very unfavorable light. And that's what often we do. We vilify the other in order to get people not to consider what the person's saying. And that's satanic, by the way. When I vilify you in order to get someone not to listen to you, that means I'm being satanic. Maybe that's not my intention, but it's simply not the way to do things. If someone is a brother in the Lord, you, out of grace, need to give him the benefit of the doubt and see him in the most favorable manner until he's done something that makes him blameworthy. So if you don't consider me, brother, that's okay. You can attack me. But if you, I'm, I'm saying you generally. I'm not saying anyone does. But if you think that this man is a brother in the Lord, I disagree with him, but I'm not going to vilify him in order to make him look as evil as possible in order for you not to get to hear what he has to say because that's truly of the devil. That's what the devil does. Someone who's a believer and uh, someone else that you recognize as a believer, you hear him out. That's why I kept telling the brothers, listen more than you speak. Because let me make my point. Let me finish. Before I finish, listen. See, when I want to hear another position, I listen. I don't, I start, listen. And I hear, I process it, then I have questions. Okay, well, hold on. You said this. Well, what about this? But if I don't think he's a brother, I'm going for the juggler. If you're a Muslim or Jehovah's Witness, I'm not asking you to learn. I'm asking to decimate you. Because you're a false agent, a tool of the devil. But if you're a Christian, I'll hear you out. Go ahead, brother. Okay. Yeah? All right. That's, that's my policy. That is my policy. If I consider you a Christian, I'll hear you out. If I think you're a tool of the devil... I will decimate you because it's not me now. I'm now worried about the flock. You're a wolf and you're sent by the devil to devour the flock. And if I'm a mature Christian, and I hope I am, it's my duty to love my brethren to protect them from you. See, that's a different attitude, right? But now with that said, someone read that passage. You smile at me because I consider your brother, huh? Which verse? First Corinthians. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> No, Say again? Colossians. Oh, no, yeah, just, it was Colossians oh, chapter 1. Like the way you laid that out. Yeah, yeah. No, because that's what it is. What yeah. verse? Colossians 1. Now, 
you guys, if you if you have stones, please put them in the in your trunk. So give me at least five minutes to run because I'm going to leave the state. Okay, Colossians one. This is what when Matt Slick, who's my brother in the Lord, he did something that I thought he shouldn't have done. He tried to vilify me, and it didn't work though. You can listen to the debate. He tried to vilify me, and I said, Matt, you're misrepresenting me, guy. Listen to what I'm saying carefully. And this is a passage that's a nightmare for those who believe in limited atonement. If you believe Christ only died for the elect, this is your nightmare passage. This is what messed me up. One of many, this one was a chief one. This one, I would keep reading over it and reading over it, and I wrestled because I was convinced the five points of Calvinism must be biblical, and any passage that doesn't agree, I'm misinterpreting it. See, it wasn't maybe the system is wrong. No, it's the explanation of this verse that's wrong because the system is airtight. But then the Lord released me. That's why I don't subscribe to a system. I'll let the Bible speak. And if something that you believe doesn't agree, I'll say, brother, okay, you believe that? God bless you. I, I can't accept it. I can't accept it. You want to accept That's okay. I can't accept it. I may be wrong. I may not be able to see what you're seeing. Pray for me to get to that point. But if you're wrong, may the Lord show you. Right? I mean, if you think you're right, obviously you don't believe something because you think you're wrong. But you may be wrong and not know it. So this is why I began the session. I'm going to emphasize like a broken record. Seek the Holy Spirit. Please show me where I am wrong. Please guide me and break my pride if I'm not willing to give up. Because that's what I did. I came kicking and screaming. I did not want to give up on Calvinism. No, no. And the Holy Spirit said, yes, yes. And who do you think is stronger, me or the Holy Spirit? And he brought me to my knees. But go to Colossians 1. Let's read 13 to 17. Now get ready. If you do believe in limited atonement, get ready. And if you believe that Christ died for everyone, get ready to be troubled. Get ready to be troubled. I'm letting you know. So if you're troubled, I told you, right? So don't get upset at me. Colossians 1, 13 to 17. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Pause for a second, my brother. Would anyone deny when it says, by Christ, all things were created in heaven and earth? That means every creature? Everything. Now, if you want to go the route of Joe Witness and insert the word other, that's what they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In their translation, all other things. Yeah. They can't have Jesus creating everything in heaven and earth. So now, get, I'm smiling because I know where this is going to go. Oh boy. Everything in heaven, that means angels, Satan, and it, it goes on. Dominions, and, right? Clear, right? All right. Keep reading. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things hold together okay, now clear as day all things in heaven and earth means the entire creation no one is excluded right even spiritual powers because as dominions principalities authorities right all right if you if it's clear as day now read 18 and 20 and notice the second half of what many believe is a hymn actually if you read commentaries, they'll tell you they think that Paul is actually citing an early Christian hymn. That it's a hymn that Paul incorporated by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's what some believe. We don't know for sure, but that's a belief. There are several statements in Paul that people think are hymns of the church. This is one. The other is Philippians 2, 5 to 11. It's called Carmen Christi, a hymn to Christ, where it says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality of God something to exploit, but made himself nothing by taking on the form of a slave, etc. Some think that's also a hymn that Paul incorporated. Whether it's a hymn or not, still it reflects what Paul and the church has believed. Right? Now notice the second part, 18 to 20. And he is the head uh, of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. That is, in everything he might be preeminent. Okay. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the oh, blood boy. of the cross. Uh-oh. 
Did the light switch go on for anyone? Verse 20. Jesus made peace by the blood of the cross for who? All things. All things. All, All things where? In heaven and earth. Right? On earth right and where? Up and down. On earth and where? Yeah. But that's parallel to 16, right? Yep. All things that he created in heaven and earth, he's now procured the redemption of everything he created in heaven and earth. That's the parallel. I know it's not true, but there's some people out there professing to be Christians that take this scripture Universalism, huh? and say, yeah. because of what he did, he died yeah. for everybody, therefore everybody will be in heaven. Now, just two comments I would say. Number one... I know it's not true. Yeah, well, number one, I'm not a universalist, but remember, you're already adamant it can't be true and you even question their Christianity. Could they be wrong and still be Christians? Because the way you, you, you stated God, it, I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. but the way you stated it, they profess to be Christian, meaning you don't think they are. I think their theology puts some questions out if, there. If perfect theology is a prerequisite, you yeah, and me will be the first in hell. <laughs> we're all going to hell. I agree. We can be gracious and say, you're wrong, but you're a brother in Christ, because this is not one of those doctrines that will damn you. Right? I mean, I don't think your view of the afterlife, whether hell is forever, or it's a short period of time, and then it's remedial, God will then cure you or wipe you out. We can disagree without assuming that the person who disagrees with me, he's the one going to hell. Maybe they're right, you're going to end up in hell. Right? And it's possible. Sure. But just like you'd want him to hope that you're going to heaven, wish that for him. Right. Mm -hmm. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Right. Yeah. Wish that unto him. Lord, if he's wrong, I'm right. Have mercy on him. If I'm wrong, he's right. Have mercy on me. See, there are some issues worth fighting over. I don't think these are one of them that I would go to blows with. Now, if you tell me Jesus isn't God, give me a stone and give me a baseball bat. <laughs> I understand where you're going. Where does repentance, if universalism is where a person's theology is, yes. then there's really no need for repentance. Well, they're saying and those... for that matter, yeah, obedience. Yeah, that's not their position. Their position is if you've died rejecting Christ, that's why you will go to hell. Because that's where you will be punished for your unrepentance. But the purpose is not to wipe you out or... To prolong your judgment, it's to purge you and purify you of your evil so that now you enter heaven and are grateful for what Jesus did. So they say that's what hell is there for, for the person who refused to turn to Christ, right? So again, I'm not making a case for universalism. I'm not a universalist. But what I'm saying is the first to present his case seems right until and his neighbor comes and questions him. You've heard criticisms of their view, but have you ever sat and listened to someone make a case for their view and then decided whether they're wrong? Right. You see the point? Yes. Let me give you another verse that goes with this. And don't lose your place in Colossians. Keep it there, because we didn't finish Colossians. Got it. Go to Proverbs 18 13. See, with me, if someone's a Trinitarian who loves and worships the Triune God and believes Jesus is the God man, that he's born of the Virgin Mary, he died physically for our sins, was raised physically, will return physically and bodily, and believes the Bible is God's perfect word, that is enough for me to consider you my brother and sister in Christ. Everything else we can agree to disagree and fight over, right? That's me, just me. I'm not God. God could say I could care less for your opinion. Well, that's just me. If you're an anti-Trinitarian, no, no, we're going to debate until you repent. <laughs> that's not going to happen. No, no, Jesus is no created Archangel Michael. That Jesus can't save anyone. But... Proverbs 18.13 is another passage we need to put take to heart. Someone read that for me. He that answereth an a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So when you rush to judgment to answer before hearing it out thoroughly, what did the text say? You're being, and I'm not saying you, you. You're being right. stupid and foolish. Fool and sure. Right? So you see, this is wisdom from God. Don't rush to judge. Don't speak before you've heard something thoroughly. And don't settle for the first opinion, because the first to present his case seems right until his neighbor comes and questions him. That was the same chapter, verse 17. So by now, coming back to Colossians 1. Let's go back to Colossians 1. Got it. Now, let's read 16 and 17 again. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold. Now read verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So if in verse 16, all things in heaven and earth means the entire creation without exception. So did Jesus create everything in heaven and on earth without exception? Correct. But then how do you then avoid the implication of verse 20? He also procured the redemption of all things on earth and in heaven. Who's exempted from the work of his redemption? Nobody? Well, those are rejected. Yes, but not, not talking about its application. Okay, all right. Redemption accomplished is not the same thing as redemption applied. Right. You know what I'm saying? When he accomplished redemption, who did he accomplish it for? Everybody. Everyone, right? Yes. So then how can limited atonement be true? That he only died for the elect. Good point. Right? Now, how did I get vilified in the debate to make me look bad? Let me tell you. You can watch the debate. Oh, so you're saying he died for Satan. I said, Matt, mm -hmm. number one, if it means everything, it means everything. So if it means Satan, yes, but Satan will not be saved because he won't believe, because there's a condition. You must believe to receive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you see, he poisoned the well to make my position look so blasphemous so people wouldn't hear me out when I was just being exegetical. Mm -hmm. I said, just read it. I go, explain to me who the everyone. He couldn't do it. Go listen. He couldn't do it. So he resorted to what I call, and he, I'm not saying he did it deliberately. He's a brother in the Lord, but he's so passionate about this tradition, he ended up vilifying me out of emotional response. He did, and I'm, I don't hold it against him. I understand. When you are invested emotionally, it's very hard to let something go. So he, the Calvinists had a field day. Oh, Sam Shimon says Satan's going to be saved. That's what they said. And that's not what I said. I said, Matt, the text exegetically, if all things in heaven and earth... You have no problem admitting Jesus created it. Then deal with the parallel. All things on earth and in heaven, he has redeemed and made peace with the blood of his cross. So then Satan will be saved. No, because accomplishing redemption is not the same thing as applying it because there's a condition you must believe to receive. He made it available to all. You got it. But the Calvinist doesn't like that. No, Jesus actually saves. He didn't make salvation a possibility. Well, that's fine and dandy. That preaches well. Give me exegesis. Mm -hmm. Deal with the text. It's right there. I didn't write Colossians. See, this is, my, this is the problem I was having as a Calvinist. I had to explain away a lot of passages. So quite clearly, to answer the sister's question, there is no doubt that everyone that God created, He desires their salvation. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Now, how does predestination work? That's a topic that would require me. I can't go into it, but it requires more than a two-minute soundbite, right? Because then you have to talk about what is actually being predestined, who is being predestined, and what's the relationship with free will, human responsibility. And in Christianity, you have various attempts of harmonizing it. It's not just the Calvinist understanding. God has predestined everything. If you actually force a Calvinist against the corner and say, do you acknowledge God predestined even the rape of a child? They have to say yes. They will tell you yes, because God has a purpose. Now, if it's biblical, hey, live with it. See, if it's something biblical, and I can't, okay, man, you know what? As hard as that pill is to swallow, the Bible says it, I have to trust God, because his thoughts are not mine. But a consistent Calvinist will tell you, yes, even the raping of that child was predestined. Otherwise, it could not happen. But now let me tell you what they're going to say. But God didn't force the rapist to rape the child. The rapist freely raped the child out of his own sinful inclination. Fine. Could he have chosen otherwise? No, if it's predestined. That's what they'll tell you. No. If it's predestined, he had to rape. But did God force? No. He did it out of his own free will, meaning his sin, because they do believe in free will. The freedom to act consistently with your nature. So you have the freedom to act in accord with your nature. But your nature is such you can't act contrary to it. For example, I want to fly like Superman. If I go to a 
high, high building. And I go up, up, and away, splat, because my very nature does not allow me to fly. So yes, you have the freedom, the free will, to operate within the limitations of your nature. So when Judas, let's say, betrayed Jesus, he did it freely because as a sinner, his sinful heart desired to betray Jesus and God didn't compel him. But could have Judas chosen otherwise? No, he couldn't. And could God have stopped Judas? Yes, he could. Because in the Bible, you find God stopping people from carrying out specific sins. I'll give you one example. Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Abraham was too afraid to say, Sarah is my wife. So she, she said, she's my sister. And by the way, she was his sister. Did you guys know that? She was his sister. You guys looking at me like you're angry. Please forgive me. But you guys know that? Sarah was his sister. He says it. You know where he says it? If you go to Genesis 20, 12, he says, she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father. Mm -hmm. Different mother. Yeah, she is my sister. <laughs> Same dad, different mom. I didn't lie to you. So technically, I was speaking the truth. She's my wife. Right? Genesis 20, verse 12. We got the same daddy, not the same mommy. So I didn't lie to you. Yeah, but you forgot the extra detail. She's not just your sister. She's your wife. Oops. But then just to tell you, he, and here's a man called the father of the faithful, how cowardly he was. And that same Genesis 20, if you read verse 13, he says, I made a covenant with her. If I find favor in your sight, don't tell people you're my wife because you're beautiful and they'll kill me. Tell them you're my sister. She agreed to it. I don't know if that sunk in, ladies. Sarai, who later became Sarah, was willing to be violated by men to save her husband's life. And her husband was willing to allow his wife to be ravished to protect his wife, to protect his life. Who showed greater faith and love there? Sarah or Abraham? Sarah. Sarah. I love you so much, I'm willing to be ravaged by another man to spare your life, but you don't love me enough to fight for me and die for me. Mm. How many women would stick around with a man like that today? Right? And she did. So we often forget the faithfulness of Sarah. Why God loved her. See, it moves me sometimes. Some of these stories move me in my spirit. Why God loved her and said, she will be the mother of the child of the covenant. Because she's a great woman, Abraham. <clears throat> it's amazing. God is good. Anyway, when Abimelech took uh, Sarah, and right before he sleeps with her, he has a dream. It's Genesis 20, I'm not making up verses 1 to 6. You're as good as a dead man. You're as good as a dead man. Because you've taken another man's wife. And he said, will you punish my people and my innocence? Did he not tell me this is his wife? He goes, I know. This is why I kept you from sinning against me. This is why I kept you from sinning against me. So God stopped him. What's the point? Calvinist who's consistent has to say, yes, Judas's betrayal, that rape was predestined. God didn't make the person do it, but God did predestine it so that even though the person did it freely, he couldn't have, he couldn't have chosen contrarily. So that's one view of reconciling God's knowledge and human responsibility. There's another view. It's called middle knowledge, Molinism. One of its greatest defenders is William Lane Craig. Yeah. One of his greatest. Middle knowledge, basically, and Alex will correct me here if I'm, if I'm mistaken. God knows all possible universes. Yeah. He knows how every person will react in a given universe. So if I put you in situation A, this is how you react. If I put you in situation B, this is how you react. So God knew that this world is the only possible world where he could get the maximum number of people to be saved freely because of the circumstances that this universe would, would we'd, we'd uh, find ourselves in. I'm trying to articulate it clearly. So this view says God knows all things and he knows that if I want the most number of people to be saved, this is the only world I can create. Because there is no possible world will everyone freely believe. So the only world I can create where I can get the most number of people to freely be saved is this one. And that's why God created it. So that's another view. But there's a third view that many people don't like. It's called open theism. The champion of this view, his name is Gregory Boyd. This view says God is infinitely wise, infinitely intelligent, 
and knows every possible choice anyone can make given the situation he or she finds himself or herself in. But the future does not exist. There is no future. It doesn't exist. So when this open theist will ask you the question, when you say God knows the future, how? It doesn't exist. So either he created it, but if you say he created it, that means he also created everything that will take place in the future, so you end up being a Calvinist. Right? So how do you escape that the future and the future decisions of free will creatures are not determined by God? If you say he knows the future because he created it, that means if he created the future, he created everyone in it and what they'll do, you're now a Calvinist. For so, foreknowledge does not make you... What does foreknowledge mean? Now, I'm just telling you how I'm playing angelic advocate. <laughs> what does uh, foreknowledge mean? It means you're God. Okay, well, what does it mean for God to have foreknowledge? There's something before that. He has time and space means he, he, he can go anywhere, which direction he wants. A time that doesn't exist or that he created it? It hasn't existed yet. Okay, so then... What's, them, what's, what's there for him to foreknow when it doesn't exist? I, I, when I get there, I'll let you Exactly know. the point. That's a very good answer as well. You can say, I don't know how God knows it, but that's my response. And there's no shame in saying that. You know why? Let me tell you why. What your answer was very biblical and respectful. Because there are things about God we won't know. So you can tell some legitimately, I don't know how he knows the future. He knows it without having to create it and everything in it. Right. How? I don't know, and I'm good with that answer. Because the Bible says, God's ways are not my ways, His thoughts are not my thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so is God's ways and thoughts. So I may not know, but it doesn't mean you're right. Yeah. Excellent answer. Now, Itisham, one one quick uh, question because you did give a number of verses. I didn't I didn't write down the verses that you yeah. mentioned from the from the Quran, which say that the Bible has been corrupted. But I remember you referencing some verses. Uh, could you could you kind of uh, give us the ones you think are most are most clear, and then and then Sam can. All right. Uh, the Quran chapter two verse seventy five. Quran chapter two uh, verse nine. Quran chapter three verse seventy eight. Quran chapter three verse. 187, uh, Quran chapter 5, verse 13 through 15 through 14, talks about the corruption of the scriptures of the Jews and Christians as confirmed by Tafsir ibn Kathir, uh, Quran chapter 6, verse uh, 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 91. And if you want to know why, uh, what the Quran's talking about by the Torah and the Injil, I can, I can get into that if, if you want. All right, Sam, on the issue of what the Quran says about the Bible. Go ahead and go ahead and, and share yes. your thoughts. And if you want, if sure. you want me to pull up any verses for you, I can. Other sure. than that, I'll, I'll probably yeah, stay it. out of it. Yeah. Notice what he did here. He says that Muhammad confirms the corruption of Scripture, but then he appealed to the Bible to prove that Muhammad is a prophet. Classic uh, case of circular reasoning. Did you guys hear what he said? Yeah. Muhammad confirmed that the Bible is corrupt, and he quoted certain evangelical scholars out of context. He quoted Craig Blom Blomberg out of context, and I'm going to press him on that to quote Blomberg in context. So make sure you have his book ready with the page number so we can read in context what Blomberg actually said. But guys, hear it. This is the beauty of Islamic apologetics. Muhammad confirms the Bible's corrupt, and Muhammad is a prophet because he fulfills biblical criteria for prophethood. So a corrupt Bible confirms that Muhammad is a true prophet who then confirms that the Bible's corrupt. Masterful. I mean, honestly, I think this was going to convince many people to take Shahada. But every passage that you quoted from the Quran was misquoted. None of those passages, and this is why I want to engage you, say that Muhammad taught the Bible's corrupt. Now, I'm going to just go to chapter 2 of the Quran, and I want you to write these down, the Tisham, because these are your verses from the same chapter, chapter 2, that you're going to have to address in context because you misquoted 275. You took it out of context. Write down chapter 2, verses 40 to 44, chapter 2, verse 89 and 91, chapter 2, verse 97, Chapter 2, verse 101, chapter 2, verse 113, chapter 2, verse 136, and that's just in chapter 2. Again, you misquoted chapter 3, verse 78 of the Quran. You wrenched it out of context, as well as chapter 3, verse 187. So here I'm going to ask you to write down chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Write these down, because you're going to have to engage these texts. Your own Quran, which you quoted out of context to make it say something you didn't. Chapter 3, verse 48. Chapter 3, verse 50. Chapter 3, verse 113 to 114. Then he went to chapter 5 and misquoted chapter 5, verse 13 out of context to make it say something that the context says it cannot be saying unless you believe the Quran is full of contradictions, and it is, but for other reasons. 
So write down chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 43 to 48, chapter 5, verse 66, and chapter 5, verse 68. Write those passages down. And then again, you did it with chapter 6, verse 91. You again quoted it out of context. So again, I'm going to help you read your own Quran in context. Go to chapter 6 of the Quran, verses 114 and 115. 6, 114 and 115. And unlike you, I'd like to engage these texts and read them to see what they say. But for the sake of time, 6, verses 114 and 115. And then add these as brownie points. Chapter 10, verse 37 of the Quran. Chapter 10, verse 94 of the Quran. Chapter 12, verse 111 of the Quran. Add that. Then add chapter 15, verse 9 of the Quran. Cross-reference that with chapter 16, verse 43 of the Quran. And chapter 21, verse 7 of the Quran. And then icing on the cake. Chapter 46, verse 12, and verse 30 of the Quran. All of which say that one of the proofs that your prophet was a true prophet, it's not that he confirmed the Bible's corrupt. He actually confirmed the Bible was incorruptible, that the scriptures are preserved and authoritative and to be used to judge Muhammad and also to live according to their dictates. So you're wrong. Muhammad did not say the Bible's corrupt. That's your misreading of the Quran, which is why you had to run to Ibn Kathir. But when did Ibn Kathir come? He didn't come in the time of your prophet. He didn't even come in the 9th century, nor did he come in the 10th century. Ibn Kathir is about 700 years removed from the time that your prophet died. So talk about being desperate. You have to go to someone who comes about 700 years later, who assumes that the Bible's corrupt, and then he misreads the passages like you do to prove biblical corruption. But conveniently, you didn't mention Ibn Qayyim, because both Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Kathir were both students of Ibn Taymiyyah. But Ibn Qayyim says that even at his time, there are a group of scholars, Muslim scholars, who say that at least in the case of the Torah, the Torah is incorruptible. Why? Because they use chapter 6, verse 115 to prove. It says, none changing the words of Allah. And Ibn Qayyim said that those scholars, Ibn uh, Qayyim, said those scholars use that verse to show because the Torah is the word of Allah, it cannot be changed. Those same scholars, Muslim scholars, at the same time, contemporary with Ibn Kathir, quoted this hadith from Abu Dawood. In the English, it's number 44, verse 34. Narrated Abdullah ibn Umar, a group of Jews came and invited the Apostle of Allah to Kuf. So he visited them in their school. They said, Abu Qasim, one of our men has committed fornication with a woman. So pronounce judgment upon them. They placed a cushion for the Apostle of Allah, who sat on it and said, bring the Torah. It was then brought, their copy of the Torah. He took it and he says, he then withdrew the cushion from beneath him, placed the Torah on it, said, I believe in you and him who revealed you. Ibn Qayyim, not me, not David Wood, said, the scholars of Islam, the scholars of Islam. I hear somebody talking. Uh, my... Who's talking? Uh, yeah, it's not. Please okay. don't talk over me. I didn't do that with you at the Sham. All right. Anyway, listen. The scholars of Islam said he would not have said, I believe in the Torah, and in him who revealed it, it was corrupted. So you selectively cite those scholars that agree with you, but then you ignore the scholars who refute you, and the scholars I cite that refute you, they're right, because the Quran agrees. The Bible is incorruptible, and it is the standard to judge Muhammad, and you even implicitly agreed. Why? Because you went to the biblical criteria to prove he's a prophet. Why would you, if you're not assuming that Muhammad has to live up to the criteria of the biblical revelation, but he fails miserably? Because why does he fail? I'm going to use the very passages you cite against you. You mentioned Deuteronomy 13. You said that a criteria, one of the criteria to prove that someone is a prophet, he must preach the same God. Sorry to burst your bubble, Muhammad did not preach the same God of Deuteronomy, which is why you're not going to say it's corrupt. But when you say it's corrupt, you prove my point, Muhammad is a false prophet, which is why you have to argue biblical corruption. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1, it says that the Israelites are the sons of God. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, it says that God is their spiritual father who spiritually begot them. And Deuteronomy 32, 18 to 20 says that he is the rock that gave them birth spiritually, not physically, because God is not a physical being. And they are his sons and daughters who proved perverse. The same Pentateuch, because Deuteronomy is part of the collection called Pentateuch. In Exodus 4, verse 22, it says that Israel is my firstborn. Let my son go to worship me. And if you don't let my firstborn go, go I'll kill your firstborn. God speaking through Moses to Pharaoh. So according to that very book, the God of Moses is a spiritual father to the Israelites. The Israelites are his sons and daughters that he gave birth spiritually to. But your prophet, your Muhammad, in chapter 5, verse 18 says, the Jews are not the sons of Allah, neither are the Christians. Your prophet, your Muhammad said that no one is a son to Allah. The highest relationship they can have with your God is a slave to master relationship. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. So the very Deuteronomy 13, you cited, so you can't now backpedal, condemns Muhammad as a false prophet, as an antichrist. 
And then you had the audacity to go to John 1. My goodness, you went to John 1 saying another criteria to prove that uh, a prophet is a true prophet. He denies that he's Elijah and he's the, he denies he's the Christ. That is a gross perversion of John 1, 19 to 25. There is no criterion given in John 1, 19 to 25. What it's saying is to John the Baptist, are you the Elijah? No. Are you the Christ? No. Are you the prophet? No. That's all it's saying. But it's ironic you use John 1. Now you're stuck with it at Tisham. You better not backpedal and tell me it's corrupt. Because that's the same John where John the Baptist said that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who is before me and greater than I, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus Christ is the Jehovah of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, all of which you deny and the prophet deny. So according to John 1, Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist condemned to the pit of hell. According to John 1, you quoted it. So I want you to say, you agree with John 1, that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that he's the Son of God who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and that he's Jehovah of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, because that's what John the Baptist says in that very chapter that you quoted out of context. Now, I don't know how much more time I have, David, because um, I will have a field day with this at a point. Yeah, I, I know you could, yeah, it's, uh, I know, basically, Etishem, br Etishem brought up a bunch of points, and I know you would have something to, to say on Let's all of these points, but I kind of like to uh, probably go through one point at a time. So, uh, right. Itishem, on that, on this particular issue of Ma what Muhammad thought about the Bible, what did you? What would your response to Sam be? All right, so let's deal with the whole Torah, the Prophet confirming the Torah, hmm? uh, Hadith. That Hadith is actually a weak because you don't. Uh, no. uh, you're going to a weak source, anyways. Abu Dawood does have weak Hadith. In it, um, you know, like the whole sun setting in the muddy spring, that's a weak hadith that was accurately classified as Sa'i and things like that. And if you want the scholars who say that, it's yeah, a give weak it to me because I have Adabani saying it's not weak. So, are you making things up? I have it right here. Yeah. Sunnah.com. Well, let me make my comment. Let me make my comment. On uh, Sunnah.com, it gives the grading. It's not Da'if. Give me the grading. That's Al Albani's classification. Secondly, are you telling me that Ibn Qayyim, now I want you to answer this, is an ignoramus who is a moron. And the scholars he cited were ignoramuses and morons because he said the scholars quoted this hadith from Abu Dawud to prove that the Torah is not corrupt. And are you saying that Ibn Kathir, whom you cited, is another idiot? Because if you go to Tafsir Ibn Kathir, open it up, chapter 5, verse 41, in him, he cites that hadith and he doesn't say it's weak. So now I'm going to call out your bluff. Give me the name of the scholar that says this is Da'if, it cannot be used. Ibn Qayyim and the scholars of his day said it's not Da'if. Ibn Kathir, open it up, I have it in front of me. You have it with you? Open it up, chapter five, verse 41, he cites the Hadith and doesn't say it's Da'if. So why are you making up the classifications as you go along? Well, I mean, uh, like I said, this whole argument is dead. Like Muslims have already refuted it, but Ibn Hazm in his book, uh, al Fisil, Al-Malil, Al-Walal, Al-Fahil, volume one, page, 237, I know I butchered the Arabic, but even he says that, uh, you know, it's a fabricated report that reached us with false, without a proper chain of transmission. So he, Ibn Hazm says that Hadith is weak anyways. Uh, you know, so even if you want to bring it's authentic or whatever, according to Ibn Hajar, who, you know, I know it's saying it refers to the original Torah that was revealed to Moses. That's not the Old Testament. That's some uh, revealed scripture revealed to Moses. So, you know, so scholars have different interpretations of that. It doesn't mean what you want it to mean. It's not, it's not even authentic according to some Muslim scholars anyways. So, uh, no. Are, Do you want me to adjust it now? Uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to clarify. You, I just wanted to clarify because there, there, will, there are viewers who don't know what you guys are talking about right now. So, to be clear, you're talking about the Hadith from Sunan Abu Dawud right now, from the, the one that, where, where yes. Muhammad tells the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah? Is that, is that the, you're both addressing that one, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so everyone, just okay, let just, just yeah, just, yeah, just let me tell people what that hadith is about, and then they can understand what the what the dispute is about. In in that hadith, the Jews uh, are having a dispute about about uh, they want Muhammad to judge a dispute they're having. Muhammad tells them to bring a copy of the Torah, and then Muhammad uh, sits on a kind of judgment cushion that signifies that he's the judge in the dispute. So he tells the judge to bring the I mean, he tells the Jews to bring a Torah. The Jews bring him a copy of the Torah. And Muhammad says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you after putting the uh, the Torah on the judgment cushion. So the suggestion is that the 
um, that the the Torah is their actual judge. And so uh, the perspective of people who say that uh, that Muhammad affirmed the reliability of the Jewish scriptures is that, well, Muhammad said he believes in in the Torah there, and he's talking about a physical copy that existed during the time um, of, of the seventh century. And so, and so the, the, the criticism would be, well, what's he really talking about there? Uh, is, he, is he just affirming the Torah or is he affirming the entire Old Testament? And then in addition to that, is, the, is that Hadith reliable? So is that a real situation that Muhammad actually said that in? And that's kind of, that's kind of the yeah. issue. That's, that's kind of the, that, that's the issue they're discussing. I just wanted people to understand what, what you guys are talking about right now. Okay, guys, I just gave you the classification, sunnah.com. It's not run by Christians or Jews. Grade. Hassan al-Albani, if you guys don't know who al-Albani is, Muslim scholars, specifically the Salafi, consider him to be one of the greatest scholars of the 20th century, Sheikh al-Albani. Hassan, that means it's good. It's not daif. Even daif doesn't mean it's not true, because then I'm going to have to talk about the classification, how even Sunni scholars say daif means passing. It's it's passed, but this is Hassan. That's number one. Number two, Ibn Kathir, whom you cited, you cited Ibn Kathir. Open up to his exposition of chapter 5, verse 41. I have him. It's in my articles that you claim was refuted. Far from it. They failed to refute anything. Glory to Jesus Christ. 541, Ibn Kathir cites the same hadith to explain the context of chapter 5, Surah Al-Maidah, when the Jews came to him for judgment. And he doesn't say it's forged or it's weak. But beyond that, Ibn Qayyim, companion of Ibn Kathir, both of them the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Qayyim says, there are a group of scholars who use that hadith as proof the Torah has not been corrupt. So you're stuck with it. You, Shabir and Basam, you're stuck with it. It's a nightmare for you guys. I understand. But come on over to the truth and reject Islam and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But let's go beyond that. You just told everyone that it's referring to the original Torah given to Moses. No, the hadith is talking about the copy of the Torah in the hands of the Jews. He said, bring me your Torah. But thank you, because you just implicitly admit that has to be the Torah of Moses, because if he's confirming it, that means they have accurate copies of the Torah given to Moses. So you just made my point. But finally, and here's my challenge to you, Tisham, open up your Quran, show me a sentence in your Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses. I'm not asking you to show me where the Quran says a book was given to Moses. Kitab. I know the Quran says a Kitab was given to Moses. You said Torah was given to Moses. Quote the verse. And show me the Arabic where it says, and the Torah we sent down to Moses. Show me that. And if you can't show me that, where did you get that information from? So that's my challenge. Please, please answer my question. Uh, Quran chapter 3, verse 3. Hang on, wait, wait. It doesn't say Torah given to Moses. I know the Arabic. It says it confirms the Torah and the gospel. So again, maybe I wasn't clear. I'm trying to help you avoid answering the question directly. Let me repeat it again. Chapter 3, verse 3 to 4 does not say the Torah is given to Moses. It says the Torah and the gospel were given as guidance and light to mankind. I'm going to repeat the question one more time. Show me in the Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses, like in chapter 5, verse 46, it says the gospel was given to Jesus. See, the Quran is clear. The gospel we gave to Jesus. Show me where it says the Torah we gave to Moses. Don't quote me a verse where it says Torah. I know it's there. Torah given to Moses. Give me the verse. Uh, okay, yeah, so the Quran... Um the Quran chapter two verse seventy. Uh, the Quran chapter two verse fifty three says we gave Moses the scripture. So, you know, I mean, uh, so what, what, like, and then the Quran chapter forty six verse twelve. Uh, yeah. So you know. So, but regardless, uh, you know, we Muslims don't believe that the Old Testament was revealed to Moses. Uh, you know, like the like the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. We don't believe that, anyways. So I, I don't I don't know what your argument is. What's your what's your argument? Okay, <clears throat> notice what you said right now. You just said we don't believe the Old Testament was given to Moses. You believe the Torah was given to Moses, and you just quoted two verses that says a book was given to Moses. How do you know that even though the book of Isaiah is attributed to Isaiah for argument's sake? Because remember what you said. I want you to hold you consistent. The Old Testament, New Testament, they're corrupt. So how do you know that the book of Isaiah? wasn't falsely attributed to Isaiah, but it was actually written by Moses because the Quran doesn't tell you what was given to Moses. How do you know the Torah was given to Moses? Where'd you get that information? See, if you don't know that answer, I'll show you why I'm asking you the question, because you said, I want everyone to hear it. We believe the original Torah given to Moses. No, you don't, because the Quran doesn't tell you any original Torah was given to Moses. How do you know it was given to Moses? How do you know what book was given to whom? You're not told the Torah was given to Moses. The only thing you're told in the Quran 
is that the gospel is given to Jesus and that David wrote Psalms. Let me give you the verses there. Chapter 4, verse 163 of the Quran and chapter 17, verse 55 says that to David we gave the Psalms and to Jesus we gave the gospel. So how do you know who the Torah was given to? It says a book was given to Moses. Well, what's that book? How do you know what book was given to Moses? So this is what I'm asking. Because when you answer, you're going to show that you're dependent on my Bible to fill out the gaps in your Quran, the very Bible that in one breath you want to use to prove Muhammad, but then condemn it because it exposes Muhammad. So how do you know what was given to Moses? How do I know what was given to Moses? Well, we got to do some reasoning here. We got to know what the Quran's talking about and uh, things like that. So Allah is clearly saying he gave the, the Torah or the revelation to Moses, but that revelation is not the Old Testament. So... Uh, you know, according to Tafsirs, according to Hadith, and uh, things like that. Again, keep in mind that we have to keep everything in its proper context. We have to keep everything within its proper uh, understanding what the Muslim scholars have understood. And the Muslim scholars have always understood that the Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures. Uh, you know, so, I mean, uh, if you read Tafsir, Ibn Kathir, uh, you know, Ibn Abbas, all these, you know, early Muslim scholars don't agree with your view. So, like... Uh, so, like, what's your argument here? Okay, like, let, me, let me respond. Yeah. Okay, it to Sham, this is now the third time I just said. Ibn Qayyim, who's a contemporary of Ibn Kathir, says there's a group of scholars that said the Torah is incorruptible. Why do you keep saying that this is the view of the Muslim scholars? The early Muslim scholars don't agree with me. They actually do agree with me. They disagree with you. Ibn Ishaq, that you tried to throw under the bus and went to Ibn Sham, he believed the Bible is not corrupt. Tabari believed the Bible wasn't corrupt. Ibn Qayyim mentioned scholars that said that the Torah is incorruptible. I just mentioned them. And you keep telling me all the scholars are on your side. No, they're not. Even Bukhari said the Bible is not corrupt. And I have the citations in front of me. And you know who told me that Bukhari said that the scriptures are incorruptible? Ibn Qayyim. He quotes Bukhari. He even says Ar-Razi. Ar-Razi says that the Torah is incorruptible. So where are you getting that all the scholars, all the commentators agree with you? No, they don't. There were scholars that agreed the Bible is not corrupt, but then as they saw the problem, the Bible as it existed at that time exposes Muhammad as a fraud, then they had to then adopt the approach, well, that means the scriptures were corrupted. No, it means Muhammad is a fraud. doesn't mean the scriptures are corrupted, especially when the Quran agrees that the scriptures are incorruptible, preserved, and the scriptures of the Jews and Christians were the pure words of God that Muhammad appealed to to verify his claim. So stop saying that the commentators are on your side. They're not. In fact, here, I'm going to prove it to you. If you have Ibn Kathir, I want you to read for me what Ibn Kathir says about Jesus confirming the Torah between his hands. And here are the references. Please write these down. And if you have the English translation, you don't need to know the Arabic. In chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran, 48 and 50, what does Ibn Kathir say about Jesus confirming the Torah? Chapter 3, verses 48 and 50. And then what does he say about Jesus confirming the Torah in chapter 5, verse 46? And then what does he say about Jesus confirming the Torah in chapter 61, verse 6? There, Ibn Kathir, in those three passages, actually there are four, but I count th chapter 3, it's 4850 as one. He says that Jesus confirmed, upheld, lived up to the Torah in his possession. Because in the Arabic, if you read it, it says Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands. It's musaddiqan. Lima baina yadehi. Sadaqa, the verb to mean confirm and bear witness to the truth thereof. Between his hands. Baina yadehi. So that's an Arabic idiomatic expression meaning the Torah that he had access to and read. So Ibn Kathir, the one you're quoting, tells me the historical Jesus confirmed the Torah in his possession and didn't say a single word about its being corrupt. Now, Ittisham, I'm going to challenge you. Give me a single manuscript or any textual proof that the Torah that Jesus confirmed, it is so vastly different from the Torah we read and the Torah the Jews had that Muhammad confirmed. Show me that it's completely different. It isn't virtually the same that I have today. And please, at the Sham, do me a favor. Don't appeal to variant readings because you know the crisis in Islam now with all the qirat, all the variant readings and all the corruption to the Quranic manuscripts. So please don't go there with the variant readings. Save us the time from having to go into the corruption of the Quran because it's not going to go well. Let's stick with this. Is there any manuscript proof that Jesus confirmed an Old Testament other than what I read today? What's the proof? Notice how like, Ibn Abbas says Jesus was taught the Torah in, in the womb, in, the, in his womb. It, he, wasn't, he wasn't confirming a physical copy according to Ibn Abbas's uh, view. So, uh, so, like, regardless, you know, we follow the Prophet Muhammad. I mean, the, and, like, we follow, like, what the Salaf, the first three generations say, and all of them agree with my view that the 
uh, Torah and the gospel is corrupt. So, I mean, it, even the Prophet Muhammad himself, I just said that hadith, that the Prophet Muhammad said that the Jews and Christians are corrupt in the scriptures, and the Quran says follow the Prophet Muhammad. So, uh, so why are you going to, okay. you know, why are you going to Jesus when we follow the Prophet Muhammad? Okay, um, um, maybe I wasn't clear. Nothing in what you cited from Ibn Abbas says that Jesus confirmed a Torah that God taught him directly in the woman, not the physical copy. Let me repeat it again. Chapter 3, verses 48 and 50. Specifically, verse 50, and he says, supposedly Jesus saying, because you believe in Jesus, uh, says, speaks in the Quran. That's, you believe that. You believe that's Jesus speaking in the Quran. I don't, but since you believe it, in chapter 3, verse 50 and 61, verse 6, Jesus speaking to the Jews, he says, I confirm the Torah between my hands. So you're actually seriously wanting us to believe that Jesus was saying, hey, I'm confirming some Torah that I memorize in the womb, but not the Torah that you have. You're making mincemeat out of the Quran because the Quran says, Jesus confirmed the Torah and said to the Jews, O children of Israel, I'm a messenger sent by your Lord to confirm the Torah between my hands. To the Jews hearing Jesus, they're going to say, Oh, you mean the Torah that we have, right? You're confirming that? Can you show me where in the Quran Jesus says, No, 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 no. I'm not confirming your Torah. I'm confirming the one taught to me while I was in the womb, but not what you have. You're, you're reading too much into Ibn Abbas, and you're reading out of the Quran, what the Quran plainly teaches. He's confirming whatever Torah they had that the Jews were reading. And then moreover, nowhere did Muhammad say that the scriptures are corrupt. You still didn't give me a verse. You misinterpreted what Muhammad said. And then you said that the first three generations agreed with you. No, they didn't. Wahab bin Munabba. He is a follower of the, of the Sahaba. Wahab bin Munabba. In the very verse you have referred to, please prove me wrong. I've been challenging you. Open up Ibn Kathir. Go to chapter 3, verse 78. There, Ibn Kathir mentions Wahab bin Munabba, and he says, the Torah and the Gospel remain the same because Allah's books are uncorruptible. Why would you dare say in front of everyone that the first three generations agreed with you, Wahab bin Munabba is a tabi. He's a follower of the Sahaba, the follower of Muhammad's companions. And he says, Ittisham, either you're lying or you're, you don't know what you're talking about. Benefit of doubt, you don't know what you're talking about. He says, Torah and the gospel remain as they are because Allah's books are incorruptible. They misinterpret them. And I want to say again, and I mean this, and I pray this is from the Holy Spirit. I pray the Holy Spirit owns me for the glory of Jesus and saves me from myself. I want to say to the Catholics here, I apologize for the things I've said in previous years. I've apologized for the hatred, vitriol I've leveled against you. And I speak from my heart. I love you. You're my brothers and sisters Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't care what some Protestants are going to say of me. The Catholic Church is an apostolic church started by the Lord Jesus and preserved by him till this day. I know Protestants are going to condemn me for it. But I love you. And I pray the Lord will allow me, if the Lord tarries, many more years to serve you as your brother until I die. I pray the 20 years I spent in Protestant land, that the Lord will now give me 20 years to serve these apostolic traditions. And I love you guys. I do. And you know my story. You know my miracle. For those two years where I was battling a corrupt judge, corrupt lawyers, and immoral, adulterous Jezebel. God sent Catholics, Catholics, to pray for me and to intercede for me. Can I share one miraculous story again? Do you guys mind if I do this? Because I'll do a part two with Paul Williams. I'm not in a rush. Can I, can I show you? I'm about to cry again, dude, honestly. I really am. I, and one thing is, I hesitate to cry because I don't want people to say, look, he's a fake. He's trying to put a show on. May God sanctify my motives. As I get older, I, I realize I've become more of a bigger sissy. <laughs> As I get older, I cry a lot more. I don't know. It's because I, take, I look in the mirror and say, <laughs> why couldn't you look like Brad Pitt? Why couldn't you be a Christian who was... As hot as Brad Pitt. Darn it. God even saves models. Why couldn't he make me a model and save me? Darn. Well, you know why? I'll tell you why, though. I'll tell you why I don't look like Brad Pitt. I already caused one brother to stumble. He already started thinking I was cute, and he's questioning his sexuality. So imagine if I looked like Brad Pitt. I'd be causing men stumbling left and right. So that's probably why I don't look like Brad Pitt. All right. Let me tell you a true, true story. 
November 2017. November 2017. Thank you, Louisa Campbell. Let me repeat what you just said. I learned that Catholics know a lot more scripture and are more biblically literate than your average evangelical. Yes, if you find the right Catholics who are who are studied. Now, let me, true story, guys. I like how Anna complimented me. Sam, you're beautiful in your own way. In other words, read between the lines. Yeah, you, you're not the best looking guy, but you have an inner beauty. You're beautiful inside, Sam. See, that's what people tell you when they think you're ugly and not attractive. Sam, but at least you're beautiful inside, and that's what counts. That's what counts, Sam. Good one, sister. Good one. Okay, true story. And there are witnesses that are listening. Maureen Dahul. True story. Maureen Dahul. She comes, she visits Shemiran, her sister. They're listening. They can confirm this. They're listening. They can confirm this. Listen to this. November 2017, a corrupt judge threw me out of my home, barred me. And see, when I think about it, sometimes there's, there's pain. November 6, 2017, my greatest nightmare came to pass. The judge barred me from the home because of a crooked, adulterous wife and lawyers where I could no longer go back home and put my daughters to sleep. I even have videos with me right here. I recorded a video when their mother did not show up the whole night. I recorded it still on my phone. One day I'll play it for you guys so you know I'm not lying. She was having an affair with that Puerto Rican guy, and she wouldn't come home till 4 or 5 in the morning. One night she didn't come home at all. And so I record on saying, and I even give the date and the time. I say, right now I'm going upstairs to wake up my daughters and dress them for school, and their mother hasn't come home. And I wake them up and they ask where their mommy is. And I had to lie and say, oh, mommy went to work. And I have the video recorded. It's recorded. So I used to put them asleep and they'd wake up, wake up with me. As she was committing adultery and destroying the marriage like a Jezebel. Anyway, my fear was that she would bring men into the house with my daughters there. And my fear came to pass. Yeah, I have, I have the video. I'm not lying. I'll play it. I promise you guys I'll play it. So you know I'm not lying. And so I was barred November 6. That same day, she brought that guy into the house. At night, my daughter sleeping. She didn't even wait. She brought that guy, Ricky, into the house to commit adultery, defile her like a whore in that house. And my daughters, my two angels sleeping in the other room. And I had to go sleep in my friend's garage. My friend had a garage. He converted into an apartment on a mattress at that night, not able to be with my daughters. And since then, it's been two years. I have, I have not put my daughters to sleep and woken up with them in two years. And I'm not trying to get into a sob story. Okay? Not trying to get into a sob story. That first Thanksgiving, that first Thanksgiving, that I was barred from the home, I had to celebrate it by myself. I didn't have my daughters for Thanksgiving. I wasn't with them for Thanksgiving. And so most places are closed Thanksgiving. So I wanted to go to Panera, that was closed. So a couple of sisters who love the Lord, also broken families, older sisters, we decided to meet, we went to IHOP. Now guys, listen to the story. Listen to the story. Yeah, it's the children who are suffering, not me. We went to IHOP. I was waiting for them to show up. As I pulled up, there was a small white car. Listen, true story, guys. Small white car. Park there. There were two older ladies, one in the 60s, the other in the 70s, maybe later. I know it was mother and daughter, so she was much older. But they were up, up in age. We got out of the car. They got out of the car. I sat at the table and they were sitting not too far to my left. Sisters came. We started talking about my problem. We talked about Jesus. Then it became too numerous for us to be on that table. So we went to a table in the back. And I'm talking about my problems and we're talking about Jesus Christ. Those two ladies came. 
Those two ladies came. Unbeknownst to me, they were listening. As I'm sitting, the ladies come up to me. Now imagine, here, let me eat here. Okay, I want you to see. This is the chair. Okay, you can't see the chair. The chair, right? And they come and they're standing right above me. Guys, they're standing right above me. They're standing right above me like this, looking at me. I don't know. I'm talking, right? And all of a sudden, I turn. And I'm like, hey, oh, you know what? Like this, okay. The younger of the two looked at me. She goes, oh, look at this, guys. She goes, oh, we were not listening, but we were listening. Meaning we know we shouldn't have been listening to you, but we couldn't help it. You know what she said? She goes, my goodness, the way you talk about Jesus Christ, the way you talk about Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Now, get here's the miracle. The miracle. The older of the two, which I believe was her mother, said to me when I told them my story, she says, I'm on a prayer chain, online email prayer chain. I think she said over 100,000 Catholics who pray the rosary and intercede. We're going to now include you on that prayer chain and pray for you and pray the rosary and intercede for you. Now, let me tell you why this is a miracle. The younger of the two told me that we were not supposed to be here. We were going to go to Boston Market, but it was too packed. And for some reason, we came here. Now we know why we were supposed to meet you. Who did the Lord bring? Two Catholic ladies, one of whom belongs to a prayer chain on an email, over 100,000 people, Catholics who pray the rosary and intercede. Is that a coincidence? Now, the Protestants, like James White, say, Thief! Thief! You the thief! Thief! You thief! And you son! That's what happened. True story. If you want, I can share a second miraculous story that has to do with Catholics. It's up to you. You guys want me to do it, or you want me to move on? All right. Second one. Okay, here's the second one. I start listening to relevant radio, Catholic radio. I found out that one of the people that has a show, one of the people that has a show, his name is Father Richard Simon, Teach, teaches a Bible study in my area, Skokie, Illinois, St. Lambert's. So I went to meet him. I love that man. Anyway, so I started going to his Bible studies. I started going to his Bible studies. When I went to his Bible studies, there was a lady sitting there. I had just asked the question. I had just asked the question. Now, I remember what the lady looked like. I believe she was with her son. Now, people don't know this, and it's not LMA, buddy. It's LMB. We don't use A here. People don't know this, but I started going to St. Lambert's because they would leave the church door open. And people did not know this. For those two years, I asked the Holy Spirit to confirm, should I pray a form of the rosary to the best of my ability? Okay? Yes, see, Shadow King, confirmation, Shadow King. So I would go into that church in the afternoon. I would try to do it every day. I would fall before the altar and pray a form of the rosary, and, I'll, and I can pray it to tell you what I mean by the form of the rosary. I don't know the entire rosary, but I mem memorized a certain part of it. And I would pray and ask the Lord to save me from my situation and the intercession of the Blessed Mother. And unbeknownst to people, people didn't know this. Now, that Sunday, I decided to go and pray again. Because I'm stupid, I didn't know they were having Mass at that time. Now, remember, I said I was at the Bible study that Thursday, I believe. There was this lady there. I believe she was with her husband. That Sunday, I show up. Now, watch this, guys. Watch this. Another miraculous story. I'm waiting for the service to finish. I'm waiting to the service for the service to finish. She comes out. She's there with her husband and two of her sons. And I greeted her. She greeted me. Because Father Richard uh, Simon was there doing the Mass. Now watch this, guys. Watch this. Her son, I think, was 15, 16. I'm standing there talking to her. He looks at me. I'm not lying to you. The Lord knows if I'm lying. He looks at me. He looks at me. You're Sam Shimon. I go, yeah, how do you know? He goes, oh, 
I've been following you and David Wood. My best friend is a Muslim. And I've been studying you and David Wood to refute him. And he's like starting to shake, right? And you know what he told me? He goes, I wasn't coming to mass today. I wasn't coming to mass. But something told me to show, go to mass today. And here you are, Sam Shamoon. And then the mother looks at me. She goes, now I see why you're so knowledgeable about the Bible. I go, what do you mean? I didn't even say anything. I asked the question. He goes, from your question, I could see you knew the Bible. Now it gets better. The story gets better. She tells me she's part of a group of women that do intercessory prayer every Monday. They pray the rosary. She says, from now on, every Monday, we're going to include you in our intentions and we're going to pray the rosary for you. Tell me that's a coincidence. But now it's going to get better for you guys. Her son said to me, my friend would love to meet you. Can I bring him? I go, sure. 20 minutes later, his young Muslim friend shows up around 15, 16. I answer his objections to the Trinity. You know what he says to me? This is what he says to me. He goes, yeah, the Trinity makes sense. And I really don't have any good objections against the Trinity. Lord, allow me then to meet that young Muslim man and this young Catholic boy a second time. I think it was a week or two later. We were at Starbucks. We were at Starbucks. There are other questions I answered, and he said in front of his friend, he goes, you know what? I have no reason to reject Christianity. Christianity is true. Islam is false. And that was the last time I saw them. Now, I want you Protestants who hate the Catholic Church, tell me this is not oh, the work of God. Tell me this is not the work of the Holy Spirit. No, Sam. Satan was deceiving you because you compromised, you ecumenist. These are the two miraculous stories among many where God is confronting me with Catholics. And notice Catholics that pray the rosary. Okay? Convince me, you Protestants who hate the Catholic Church, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit when I've been begging the Spirit, crying, to, uh, crying out to the Holy Spirit, you guide me to all truth. You save me from error and blasphemy. My life is yours. I love you and I yield to you. Anything that I believe that's false, destroy it from me. And I've been praying that from my heart. And the last thing I wanted to do was embrace the Catholic Church as a true church. Are you telling me the Spirit is not answering that prayer? Because you Protestants think that Catholicism is an abomination? That's just two of many. All right. Now, with that said, this is why I will not attack the Catholic Church anymore. And this is why I pray a form of the rosary because I've been convinced and persuaded by the Holy Spirit it is pleasing to the Lord Jesus. But let me tell you the, the form of the rosary I pray because I don't know all of it. Can you want me to pray it for you guys? Can I pray it here and show you what I've learned? Because I had to learn on my own. I didn't have someone walk me through it and guide me. Okay? <clears throat> In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, <clears throat> the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was, is now, and unto ages of ages, forever and ever. Amen. That's all I've memorized. That's all I know. Okay, but in verse, in verse, um, but you see the but because I'm going to bury you with the but. But what? Uh, in, in verse 14, it says the gospel is going to be preached all across the world, the whole world. Okay, now you want me to embarrass you because according to the same New Testament, Romans 1 8, Romans 10 18, Colossians 1 6, Colossians 1 23, it says the gospel is already preached the whole world before 70 AD. Burial, and we cremate it, and we now spread your ashes against the black snow. Yeah, so what's your question? The contradictions that are found within the Bible in John 15 1. Okay, so when what are you before I bury you and your contradictions? What are you? Sure. I'm Muslim. Yeah. Okay, so you just said Muhammad is a bastard because he confirmed the Bible. So do you agree he's a bastard? I never said that in my No, life. I didn't say you said. I'm saying Muhammad said it in the Quran, your toilet paper called the Quran. Chapter 2, verses 40 to 44. Stop barking before I muzzle you. Chapter 2, verses 40 to 44. Your fake prophet said, my Bible is sure that I'm going to bury you in the contradiction of the Quran, and I'll make you lick the black stone for repentance. Open up chapter 2, verses 40 to 44. Do you want to open up? No, you want to read it? I don't I don't want to read your toilet paper. Can you read it? Because you use it when you go to the bathroom. Go to chapter 2, verses 40 to 44. Read it for me. All right, bro. Have a good night, man. I'm arguing. Yeah, okay. Bye, bye. Get to the point, buddy. Don't be half, man. Don't be half man like your God. No, I don't want to be a pedophile like your prophet who licked the black stone. Insult my. Shut up, stone licker. Let the guy defend his religion. Yes, Ibn Mutah. No, he doesn't say in Genesis 24 she was three. He didn't do that. Here, I have Rashi right here. For when Abraham came from Mount Moriah, he was informed that Rebekah had been born. You see? Yeah, Bint Muta, you didn't read all of it, but Isaac was then. Let me read it. Okay, I'm going to bury you now. Isaac was then 37 years old. For at that time, Sarah died. And from that time, Isaac was born until the binding of Isaac when Sarah died for the 37 years. For she was 90 years old. Don't manifest like your prophet did started foaming. Hold on. Okay, Isaac was born and 127 when she died, as is stated. The life of Sarah was 127 years. This makes Isaac 37 years old. And at that time, Rebecca was born. Now, let's read it. Let's see what you didn't read. He waited for her until she'd be fit for marital relations. Three years and then married her. He didn't say she was three years old. You see, she misquoted it because if she read it, she's saying that Isaac was 37 and he waited three years when he was 40 to marry her. She just misquoted it because when he was 37, she still was not fit for marriage. He had to wait three years when he was 40. Then she'd be fit. It didn't say she was three. You butchered in front of me. Where does God say, I, God, my divine essence does not change? Or does he say, I, the Lord, do not change? And, and that's Malachi 3.6, six, right? What's the context yeah. of Malachi 3.6? Yeah, okay, he what's says, the context of Malachi 3.6? Don't quote verses you don't know. What does he mean he doesn't change? It means know. that he doesn't change his purpose is. That's why he won't consume Israel. Don't misquote scripture. Wait, but the same that? Malachi, can I answer you? The same Malachi 3.6, if you didn't butcher it out of context, if you read verse 1, that same God who says, I, the Lord, do not change, he says that the Lord God will be appearing to the temple after he sends a messenger to prepare for him. Malachi 3.1. Does God enter temples? Yes, he does. Because even your God descends to the Lord. Can I answer your question? Because you're misquoting Stephen and you're misquoting Solomon. I'll even make it better for you. Go to 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 to 13, where Solomon says that shall God really dwell in this house, the heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. But then if you go on, 1 Kings 8, 12, 13, the same Solomon that Stephen is parroting, it says that God appeared in a pillar of cloud. And then God says, this is my place where I will dwell and my name will be here. You Bible butcher. But I saw the, I saw the debate that you guys had on TikTok and I was like, I joined kind of late, so I was just like, well, who is this guy, like, Sam? And I looked you up on YouTube, and I watched one video, the video that you had with Matt. And I was like, I want to watch more. And I watched more, and I, I found a lot of verses that you brought up in the Quran. You're very well-versed, and you're very knowledgeable, which is rare for, I find, people who are debating to be knowledgeable in the Quran and in the Bible. Yeah. And you made me think a lot. So here's what I need you to say. Now, no pressure. You got to mean it from your heart. No, I mean it. Okay, here's what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. I renounce Islam. I renounce Islam. I do not believe Muhammad is a messenger. I do not be believe Muhammad is a messenger. Nor all of the Quran is God. Nor Allah of the Quran is God. I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. The Son of God. The Son of God. 
who loves me who loves me and gave himself for me and gave himself for me and i believe jesus died and rose again and i believe that jesus died and rose again and he's alive in his physical body and he's alive in his physical body and he'll return in his physical body and he will return in his physical body to judge the living and the dead to judge the living and the dead and my hope is in jesus and my hope is in jesus my trust is in jesus my trust is in jesus and i love him and worship him as my lord and i love him and worship him as my lord amen amen uh, personally i believe that christians lack accountability because they say jesus died for all of our sins so we're forgiven and all we have to do is ask for forgiveness but in islam it is different so i believe that what, what do you think about that i think you have no idea what you're talking about because uh for a christian to say that means he doesn't know christianity no, no I'm, not, I'm not a christian but oh then uh, what are you i'm muslim oh so you're saying that christians say jesus died for us there's no accountability but you're not a very knowledgeable muslim because according to your prophet in the sounds narration if you die saying there's no god but allah you will enter paradise even if you commit zinna and theft so it seems like it's your prophet that says there's no accountability just say the shahada don't worry about it because at the day of judgment muhammad intercede and take you out of hellfire and then the jews and christians will be sent in your place to be tortured so now you just buried muhammad so are you a muslim uh, no, you're, you're making false parallels. Uh, actually, it is a sound parallel. If you're not that intelligent to get it, let me repeat it again. When your prophet says, if someone says there's no God but Allah, he will enter Jannah. And then when his companion says, even if he's committed zinna and theft, yes. So your prophet's lying? No, but, but in Islam, we're, we're told to commit, uh, to do good deeds. Oh, you mean, so the same New Testament that says, if Jesus died for you, he died to ransom you so you don't sin, but be zealous for good deeds, and you should not sin because the Lord will rebuke you. Let's forget those passages, you Bible pervert. No, there is plenty of need for name calling because I'm stooping to the level of your prophet. Don't play high and mighty because if I quote your prophet insulting people, you're going to join me in spitting on him. So don't play high and mighty and holier than thou when you follow a hypocrite who insulted people and murdered them and had their women raped. Don't play the moral high ground with me. And why is it Islam the only major world religion that I know that guarantees you'll go to hell? What do you mean by that? In chapter 19, verses 71 to 72, it says Allah has fixed a decree. Everyone goes down to hell and only the God-fearing come out. Why is that? Is that talking about the um, the bridge of Sirat? No, there's no bridge Sirat in the Quran that you're reading later Islamic tradition back into the text. The text says, there is not one of you who shall not enter into it, a decree fixed by your Lord, and only the God-fearing will come out and it will leave the evildoers hobbling in it. Here it is. Not one of you there is, but he shall go down to it. That for thy Lord is a thing decreed, determined. And then 72 shows only the God-fearing will come out. Mm -hmm. Why is it your book says you're guaranteed you're going to go to hell, but you're not guaranteed you're going to come out lest you're God-fearing enough? Um, I'm not sure. Can you read 1971-72 for him in context so you can see I'm not misquoting? Not one of you there is, but he shall go down to it. That for your Lord is a thing decreed, determined. Then we shall deliver those that were God-fearing and evildoers we shall leave there, hobbling on their knees. So you catch it, the God-fearing and the evildoers will be in hell, but the God-fearing will come out, but the evildoers will remain hobbling there. So what kind of religion is this that causes me psychological trauma, where it guarantees I'm going to go to hell, but I don't know if I'm God-fearing that I'll be taken out. And you yeah. want me to abandon in Jesus' promises for this? So that's why you don't believe the Quran is created, right? The Quran is not created being Say it again, I want your Christian friend to hear your, that you're a pagan. So Quran is not created? Yeah, Quran is not a created being. Okay, it's is the Quran Allah? No. Okay, now, Carl, did you hear what he just said? I want you to see why your friend is a pagan. Did you hear what he just said? Carl? Mm, yes. yes. He just told you Quran is not created, Quran is not Allah. Now, Carl, I'm not too smart in math. Quran is not Allah, right? Carl, he just said it. Yes. And yet the Quran is uncreated, meaning it's not created, right, Carl? Yes. And Allah is not created. Yes. So now... One plus one is what? Two. So he just told you that there are two gods in his religion. Good job. You're a pagan. Is Allah your father? Yes or no? The word father is a creation. Allah uh, allows the creator. Okay. Where does the Quran say the word father is a creation? Show that to me. No, I'm using that just, this is what I'm telling you. Like, that's what I'm saying. But you're not the God. Word father, all fathers, not God. every father that has existed is creation. Okay. 
You're not God. Has ever as a creation. You're not God. You're not a prophet. You don't have wahi. I could care less for your opinion. Show me in the Quran where it says the term father is creation. According to science, every father is a creation. No, because if God is the original father, then he's uncreated. So much for your science. And secondly, the word Allah, is it Arabic? Yes. So now, according to science, is Arabic eternal uncreated or a created language? Ask the question one more time. According to the science you appeal to, is Arabic an uncreated eternal language or a language that's created? It's a language that is created. So Allah's created. Thank you. According to your logic, you just buried Allah. Non-Muslims. Islam, Islam has the most beautiful rights for women. Like beating you up? Chapter 4, verse 34. That's beautiful. Narrated Abu Huraira. This Abu Huraira is classic. The Prophet said the people of Bani Israel used to take bath naked all together looking at each other. The Prophet Moses used to take bath alone. So he used to go take a bath alone by himself. Now watch. They said, Wallahi, by Allah, nothing prevents Moses from taking a bath with us except that he has scrotal hernia. So they were making fun of him. He's embarrassed to take bath with us because he has a physical defect. Okay, now watch. This one I need you to help me understand. So once Moses went out to take a bath and put his clothes over a stone. Pay attention now, Yasmin. Over a stone. And then that stone ran away with his clothes. Wow. The stone ran and stole the clothes of Moses. Then what did Moses do? Moses followed that stone. He chased after that stone saying, my clothes are stolen. Hold on, I'm sorry. My clothes are stolen. My clothes are stolen. <laughs> wait, 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 let me finish it. The, the people of Bani Israel saw him and said, Wallahi, Moses has no defect in his body. Moses took the clothes, his clothes, and began to beat the stone. Ya kafir, ya munafik. Abu Huraira added, by Allah, there are still six or seven marks present on the stone from that excessive beating. If you were living at the time, Muhammad, be honest with me. I don't want you to lie. Fear God because you believe you're going to stand before him. And Muhammad's companions came or Muhammad came, your mother's a widow, or your sister's not married, or your grandmother's not married, and they say, we're going to do muta. I'm going to marry your mother for three days and then divorce her and pay her. What do you call that? What do you call that? That's prostitution. You just called your prophet a prostitute because he allowed zawaj al-muta. Don't lie. Don't look, try to tap look, them. Look, look, look. So I did hear this in the Shi'i religion, but in the Sunni religion. No, it's in the Sunnah. Your prophet in Bukhari and Muslim, I'm going to give you the hadiths based on Surah al maida 587. He allowed muta, then abrogated it. So I'm not saying you do it till this day. I'm saying at the time your prophet, when you as a Sunni believe he allowed it, then he canceled it later. So I'm not saying you do it today. That's why I asked you. If you're living at the time of your prophet and he had made it halal, acceptable, what do you call your prophet and his companion saying, go find a woman, marry her for three days, two days, doesn't matter, pay her and divorce her. You just called it prostitution. So you just called your prophet a prostitute. You mean a pimp? Okay, let's be nice. A pimp. Okay, so you're okay with him being a pimp? No, because he's not a pimp. Oh, so you mean when they do that to someone's mother or sister, they're not treating her as a whore? Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, I want to ask you something. Do you follow the sunnah that when you eat food, that either you have to lick your fingers or have your friend lick your fingers? That's a sunnah. Okay, so now if we go to a buffet, you and I, we sit in a buffet. I'm a Muslim, you're a Muslim. We finish eating halal food and I say, my brother, I want you to receive the barakah. Lick my fingers. Would you do what Muhammad did? Because that's what he did. Would you lick my fingers for the sake of Allah and his messenger? For the sake of Allah, yes. So you would do that? Okay, he sent me a link and uh, it says in there, uh, in that link that uh, Islam says to promote, you know, uh, beating women and everything. Yes. That's so Surah Nisa. Open it up. Do you have your Quran? It says in Quran to beat them only only if, you know, they welcome other men. So they you're, all, married, so well, well, slow they're down, not slow, married. But young lady, slow down. You're speaking too fast. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you mm -hmm. can only beat them if you feel rebellion. So you're admitting 
a woman can be beat, right? Not it. It it also says it all. It also explains in hadith that there is a word written next to it, which means lightly. No, it doesn't. I've studied your deen and I've studied your hadiths. Sal Bukhari says that a woman was mm -hmm. beaten so bad she had a green mark on her body. Azbab al nuzul that means the reason why the ayah was sent down. Azbab al nuzul means the yeah. reason why it's sent down. Nuzul, yeah. right? Sayyid Muqattal. This verse, men are in charge of women, was revealed about Sa'd ibn al Rabbi, who was one of the leaders of the helpers, Nuqaba, and his wife Habiba bin Zayd ibn Abi Zuhair, both of whom from the helpers, Ansari. It happened, Sa'd hit his wife on the face because she rebelled against them. Sa'd hit his wife on the face. Then her father went with her to see the prophet. He said to him, I give him my daughter in marriage, and he slapped her. The prophet, now pay attention, said, let her have retaliation against her husband. As she was leaving with her father to execute retaliation, the prophet called him and said, come back. Gabriel, Jibril, has come to me, and Allah exalted as he revealed this ayah, this verse, right? The Messenger of Allah said, we wanted something while Allah wanted something else, and that which Allah wants is good. Retaliation was then sus suspended. Did you understand what I just read? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let me see if you did. When the woman got slapped in the face, the man, the husband slapped her in the face. It wasn't lightly. The father went to Muhammad, your prophet, and he goes, okay, get the retaliation. But then the ayah came saying, no, the man has every right to slap his wife. So where did you get lightly from this? Narrated Iqrima, Rifa, divorced his wife. So Rifa divorced his wife. Whereupon Abdurrahman bin Az-Zubayr al-Qurazi married her. Aisha okay. said that the lady came wearing a green veil and complained to her of her husband and showed her a green spot of her skin caused by beating. He hit her so hard he left a bruise. And you'll read it later. You'll see I didn't make it up. It was the habit of ladies to support each other. So when Allah's messenger came, now pay attention to this. This is Aisha, right? And then I'm going to ask you something about Aisha. When Allah's messenger came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. And look what she said. I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. In other words, the Muslim woman they suffered more than unbelieving women. That's Aisha, not me. Now watch here. When Abdurrahman, Abdurrahman heard that his wife had gone to the Prophet, he came with his two sons from another wife. She said, by Allah, I have done no wrong to him, but he is impotent. Impotent means he can't be intimate with her in bed. And is as useless to me as this, holding and showing the fringe of her garment. Abdurrahman said, Wallahi, by Allah, oh Allah's messenger, she has told a lie. I am very strong and can satisfy her, but she is disobedient. That's what the ayah says, if you fear rebellion. And wants to go back to Rifa'ah. She wants to go to her first husband. Allah's messenger said to her, if that is your intention, then know that it is unlawful for you to remarry Rifa'ah unless Abdurrahman has had sexual intercourse with you. Then the prophet saw two boys with Abdurrahman and asked, are these your sons? On that, Abdurrahman said, yes. The prophet said, now he's talking to the wife. You claim what you claim, i.e. that he's impotent? Wallahi, but by Allah, these boys resemble him as a crow resembles a crow. Did you see your prophet said nothing to the man about beating her so hard that he left a bruise on her body? Well, if I'm not a Muslim, then I probably wouldn't be okay with it. You know, you, you, know, it... So you mean if you were a Muslim and a Muslim came and raped your mother, you'd be okay with it then? Well, I'm following the ways of the prophet, right? But listen, this is, this is what I came to ask you, sir. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, get out of here. So I want to ask you this. Be honest with me. If you had a nine-year-old daughter, would you be okay with a 54-year-old man marrying her and having sex with her? Probably uh, probably not. Probably? I got a 13-year-old and a soon-to-be 11-year-old. I swear to you, I'll be in jail if a 54-year-old touched either one of them. I'll be in jail or I'll be killed. How can you follow this 54-year-old pervert who married a nine-year-old minor playing with dolls, and it's in all the authentic sources. Don't let them lie to you because they're embarrassed and they try to explain it away. You're going to follow a man who was 54 years old who took a nine-year-old and slept with her and left her as an orphan at 18, and this is your example over against Jesus? You're kidding me, right? Glory be to the one who took his servant by night from the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque 
whose surroundings we have blessed, so that we may show him some of our signs. Indeed, he alone is the all-hearing, all-seeing. Okay, now, the Quran just said, it, it's perfectly clear, it explains everything in it, all things in it, perfectly clearly. That's what it said in those verses, then it contradicted itself. So if the Quran is perfectly clear and explains all things, can you tell me just from the Quran who that servant is? Do you have the answer for that just from the Quran? We know the Prophet. Prove it. How do you know that? Where did the Quran say it's the Prophet? Why are you reading later hadiths into this? Because when you go to the hadith, it's going to embarrass you. That's why I'm saying be careful. Don't run to the hadith. So from that verse alone, can you prove to me it's Muhammad? No, but we know it's Muhammad. How do you know that? Where did the Quran tell you it's Muhammad? The name Muhammad only appears four times in your entire Quran. How do you so know it's Muhammad? Know. How do you know? I'm still waiting for the answer. How do you know? Okay, now, related to the same verse, it says, who took his servant by night from the inviolable mosque to the farthest mosque, Masjid al-Haram, Masjid al-Aqsa. Where is Masjid al-Haram? Can you show me from the Quran where and what is Masjid al-Haram? From the Quran. It's in Saudi Arabia. Where did the Quran say Saudi Arabia? It doesn't say that, but I know Masjid al-Haram is, is mentioned. Uh, and where does it tell you Masjid al-Haram is in Arabia? Secondly, what's the farthest mosque? Masjid al-Aqsa. Where is that at? Jerusalem. Where did the, the verse say Jerusalem? Why are you making things up as you go along? Where did that verse say Jerusalem? Well, this verse doesn't say Jerusalem. But the Quran told you in those six or more verses that you read, and I have a lot more, it explains all things in this book. It's perfectly clear and perfectly clearly explains the verses. How come it fails to explain this verse for you? And it's less than perfectly clear. Okay, now I got even more problems with the verse. Who's saying in 17 verse 1, glory be to him? Who's speaking? Allah. Allah. So Allah is speaking to himself and glorifying himself. Yeah. Oh, you're okay with it. So you're okay with Allah saying, glory be to him, instead of saying, glory be to me, who carried my servant by night. So Allah has to speak of himself in the third person? Yeah, that's how Allah refers to himself. Okay, saying. well, good. I'm glad you said Allah. But then Allah goes on to say, so that we might show him some of our signs. So Allah is saying, glory be to him which is me, who carried his servant by night, which is my servant, from the inviolable mosque to the farthest mosque, whose precincts we blessed, so we might yeah, show him. I'll admit, this verse doesn't explain the locations. No, but that's even more than that. What I'm asking is, why can't Allah I'm simply... i that to you. You tried to get me busted with that. I'm saying, yeah, if you're taking this verse yeah. in isolation of itself... Even it in the does. context of the Quran, you're not going to be able to figure out because there's nothing in the Quran in other verses that tell you what this means. I have to investigate that. So keep investigating. Investigate. But don't forget two points. This is the same Quran that told you it is a book that explains all things and is perfectly clear and perfectly clearly explains, explains its verses. Yet it doesn't. But here's the point I want you to focus on so we can go to another example. Allah speaking, Allah saying to himself, glory be to him which is actually me, who carried his servant by night, which is my servant, from the inviolable mosque to the farthest mosque. And now notice Allah says, whose precincts we blessed. Now, but pay attention to this part. So that we we might show him our signs, ayat. Right? Do you see Allah says we might show him? Yeah. Okay, now here's my question. If you're following the Arabic and the English. So he goes, we might show him our signs. He is the seer. Wait. So the one that Allah is showing his signs, Allah just says about him, the one that he showed his miracles to, he, the one we showed our signs to, he's the seer, the knower? Who's that? Yeah, I, I, I figured, you know, I had a feeling you might bring that up. Okay, then you're addressing it. But that's, that's ambiguous. Yeah, but my point is that he is the him. We might show him, you keep forgetting that, our signs. If that's Allah... Why would Allah need Allah to show him miracles? Allah showing himself miracles? You know what? Hold on. Yeah, exactly. Hold on. But if it's Muhammad... Oh, so, okay, so l l let me see if I understand what you're saying. Yeah. What I gather from what you're saying is that it says so that we 
that being Allah referring to himself. Yeah. We show we him. We show him our signs. And the claim is indeed he alone is all seeing. Yeah. All and, hearing, all seeing. And who's the but he? you're saying, why would Allah, after just saying we, say he? No, no. It's more than that. Allah says, we showed him our signs. And then speaking of him, he yeah. says, he, the him that we showed our signs to, he is the all seeing, the all knowing. Who's the he? Yeah, the that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Okay. If, if they want that's, that's the point I'm getting at. Okay, so is who's the he and the him? Is, and if you it. say Muhammad, it's even worse. Because if it's Muhammad, we showed him Muhammad. He may show him our signs. And Allah he, is showing the Prophet. And, oh, but then you just destroyed our it. Our signs. Then, okay, but then finish it. That he is and the seer and the knower. He is the all hearing, and all That's Muhammad. Seeing. You just said it's Muhammad. The him and the he don't change. It's the same one. Okay, that, that's what I'm saying. Okay, that's so what, that, is that's, Muhammad that's all what, hearing? What, Do you believe Muhammad? What, what okay, I, is Muhammad what, all hearing, all seeing? Because it's the same him and he in the same sentence. It doesn't change. Him we showed our signs. He is this seer. So it's the same entity. So who is it? We're still trying to figure it out. If it's Muhammad, then Muhammad is all seeing. If it's Allah, so then Allah is being uh, You're claiming that this last sentence means that uh, that it's referring to Muhammad. Being if it's all Muhammad, things. then Muhammad is the seer and the knower. So you made him God. You made him an ilah. Why wouldn't he say, indeed, we are the all-hearing, all knowing Thank all you. You got it. So the him and the he is the same person. If it's I Muhammad, see. then Muhammad is all-seeing. If it's Allah, then Allah is being shown miracles by someone else. I have to ask the Sheikh about this. Right. So this is 17.1. So look how 17.2 mentions Moses' name. Thank you. So that means Moses is a servant of verse 1. Prove me wrong. That's what I'm saying. If you just follow your, your Quran, you can't tell me the servant is Muhammad. It's most likely Moses because he's mentioned right away. And it's dealing with the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. So prove to me the servant is Muhammad. Don't try to do the work of shaitan. What shaitan? You're asking me to show you contradictions. If I'm shaitan. No, don't, don't play with my brain. I'm not playing with your brain. You asked for this. So that means you want shaitan to keep you deceived into thinking the Quran is true. Whereas we want to try to show you Jesus is the truth, not the Quran. But let's not go there. First, let's finish the point. Do you want to go outside of the Quran and go to the Hadith to explain this? We can do that. You want me to show the you? The Hadith or the Tafsir? Oh, the, either one, because the Tafsir is quoting the Hadith, like Ibn Kathir. According to Ibn Kathir, you know what this is referring to? That this is referring to Muhammad when he was taken from the Kaaba to Bayt al-Maqdas. Bayt al-Maqdas, meaning, and it's also called Bayt al-Muqaddas. Bayt al-Maqdas, Bayt al-Muqaddas, the temple in Jerusalem. So Ibn Kathir says, and all the commentators, not only him, this is when in Medina, your prophet was taken from the Kaaba, Masjid al-Haram, to Masjid al-Aqsa, which is Bayt al-Muqaddas, Bayt al-Maqdas in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, right? Yeah. Problem is there was no temple in Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed twice. The first temple was destroyed 586 years before the birth of Jesus. The second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus went to heaven. So what temple did he go? There was no temple. So that's why I say if we go to your commentators, it's going to get worse for you. 70 AD? Yep. There was no temple when Muhammad supposedly went to Jerusalem because Ibn Kithir says he went to Jerusalem on Burak with Gabriel and he tied Burak to the door entered into the temple and led the prophets in prayer. There was no temple for him to enter. And then the mosque that's now known as Masjid al-Aqsa, the Masjid al-Aqsa that you now can visit in Jerusalem, that was built by Abdul Malik around 691 AD, about six years after your prophet died. So what temple did he visit? What temple? Hmm. So what mosque did he but visit? You, okay, but do you have evidence of that? Yeah, Ibn Kathir tells me that he went to the temple. He went inside the temple and he prayed with the prophets. And the, all the commentators say that. Ibn Ashaq, there is no temple. This is just a fact of history. When Omar Ibn al-Khattab conquered Jerusalem, the, the site of the temple where it stood was a waste dump. That's where they dumped their garbage and he had to clean it out. 
That's a fact of history. That's according to your history. Didn't Omar conquer Jerusalem? Yeah. Okay. Did. When he went to the Temple Mount, where the temple used to stand, he found it as the waste dump where they would dump their garbage. The Holy House at that time did not exist. This is the mistake in your hadith and in your commentators. They're telling you you went to a house that historically did not exist. This is a fact of history, dude. Glory be to the one who took his servant by night from the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque whose surroundings we have blessed so that we may show him some of our signs. Indeed, he alone is the all-hearing, all-seeing. Okay, now... The Quran just said it, it's perfectly clear. It explains everything in it, all things in it, perfectly clearly. That's what it said in those verses. Then it contradicted itself. So if the Quran is perfectly clear and explains all things. Can you tell me just from the Quran who that servant is? Do you have the answer for that just from the Quran? We know the prophet. Prove it. How do you know that? Where did the Quran say it's the prophet? Why are you reading later hadiths into this? Because when you go to the hadith, it's going to embarrass you. That's why I'm saying be careful. Don't run to the hadith. So from that verse alone, can you prove to me it's Muhammad? No, we can't. know it's Muhammad. How do you know that? Where did the Quran tell you it's Muhammad? The name Muhammad only appears four times in your entire Quran. How do you so know it's Muhammad? Know. How do you know? I'm still waiting for the answer. How do you know? Okay, now, related to the same verse, it says, who took his servant by night from the inviolable mosque to the farthest mosque, Masjid al-Haram, Masjid al-Aqsa. Where is Masjid al-Haram? Can you show me from the Quran where and what is Masjid al-Haram? From the Quran. It's in Saudi Arabia. Where did the Quran say Saudi Arabia? It doesn't say that, but I know Masjid al-Haram is, is mentioned. Uh, and where does it tell you Masjid al-Haram is in Arabia? Secondly, what's the farthest mosque? Masjid al-Aqsa. Where is that at? Jerusalem. Where did the, the verse say Jerusalem? Why are you making things up as you go along? Where did that verse say Jerusalem? Well, this verse doesn't say Jerusalem. But the Quran told you in those six or more verses that you read, and I have a lot more, it explains all things in this book. It's perfectly clear and perfectly clearly explains the verses. How come it fails to explain this verse for you? And it's less than perfectly clear. Okay, now I got even more problems with the verse. Who's saying in 17 verse 1, glory be to him? Who's speaking? Allah. So Allah is speaking to himself and glorifying himself. Yeah. Oh, you're okay with it. So you're okay with Allah saying, glory be to him, instead of saying, glory be to me, who carried my servant by night. So Allah has to speak of himself in the third person? Yeah, that's how Allah refers to himself. Okay, saying. well, good. I'm glad you said Allah. But then Allah goes on to say, so that we might show him some of our signs. So Allah is saying, glory be to him, which is me, who carried his servant by night, which is my servant, from the inviolable mosque to the farthest mosque, whose precincts we bless, so we might yeah, show him. I'll admit, this verse doesn't explain the locations. No, but that's even more than that. What I'm asking is, why can't Allah I'm simply... i that to you. You tried to get me busted with that. I'm saying, yeah, if you're taking this verse yeah. in isolation of itself... Even it in the does, context of the Quran, you're not going to be able to figure out because there's nothing in the Quran in other verses that tell you what this means. I have to investigate that. So keep investigating. Investigate. But don't forget two points. This is the same Quran that told you it is a book that explains all things and is perfectly clear and perfectly clearly explains, explains its verses. Yet it doesn't. But here's the point I want you to focus on so we can go to another example. Allah speaking, Allah saying to himself, glory be to him which is actually me, who carried his servant by night, which is my servant, from the inviolable mosque to the farthest mosque. And now notice Allah says, whose precincts we blessed. Now, but pay attention to this part. So that we, we might show him our signs, ayat, right? Do you see Allah says we might show him? Yeah. Okay, now here's my question. If you're following the Arabic and the English. So he goes, we might show him our signs. He is the seer. Wait. So the one that Allah is showing his signs, Allah just says about him, the one that he showed his miracles to, he, the one we showed our signs to, he's the seer, the knower? 
Who's that? Yeah, I, I, I figured, you know, I had a feeling you might bring that up. Okay, then you're addressing. But that's that's ambiguous. Yeah, but my point is that he is the him. We might show him. You keep forgetting that our signs. If that's Allah, why would Allah need Allah to show him miracles? Allah showing himself miracles? You know what? Hold on. Yeah, exactly. Hold on. But if it's Muhammad, that's... So, okay, so l l let me see if I understand what you're saying. Yeah. What I gather from what you're saying is that it says, so that we, that being Allah, referring to himself. Yeah. We show we him... We may show him our signs. And the claim is, indeed, he alone is all-seeing, yeah. all-hearing, all-seeing. And who's the but he? you're saying, why would Allah... After just saying we, say he. No, no, it's more than that. Allah says we showed him our signs. And then speaking of him, he yeah. says he, the him that we showed our signs to, he is the all-seeing, the all-knowing. Who's the he and yeah, the him? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. If, okay. if they wanna, that's, that's the point I'm getting at. Okay, so who's the he and the him? Is, and if you it. say Muhammad, it's even worse. Because if it's Muhammad, we showed him Muhammad. We may show him our signs. And Allah he, is showing the Prophet. Oh, but then you just destroyed our it. Signs. Then, okay, but anyway, now let's get you, do you really do you reject Islam by heart? You don't want part of it. Islam is from hell. Muhammad is from hell. And but you don't do you want to be part of it or you reject it by you want heart? Me to be part of Satan? You want me to go to hell with your prophet? Then I'll become Nine, Islam. Nine. Do you reject Islam by heart? Do you want me to speak Swahili? Let me say it again. From my heart, your prophet is in hell. Mm -hmm. He's a son of the devil. Do you reject the Jesus of the New Testament, who is son of God, who says, I'm the way and the truth and life from your heart, which means your prophet is in hell under his feet. From your heart, do you reject that? Not by Jesus heart. says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Since your prophet reject Jesus as God's son, he's in hell under the feet of Jesus, under his shoes. Do you reject from your heart that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he brings you to the Father? From your heart, you reject it. Say, I'm going to play not your from game. my heart, not from my heart. Okay, good. That means there's hope for you. So now Jesus says, I am the truth and the life. Mm -hmm. One of the 99 names of Allah is the truth, Al-Haq. It's mm -hmm. never used for a prophet in your Quran. Jesus says, I am the truth. And then Allah is the life. But Jesus says, I am the life. Now, can you show me in your Quran where a prophet says, I am the life? There is no verse that says that. Okay. Can you show me in your Quran where a prophet says, I am the truth? I mean, I can search, but I would no, say I don't find anything. No, there isn't. Yet Jesus in my Bible says, not only mm -hmm. I am the way, I am the truth and the life, and you cannot come to the Father except through me. If I go with my Bible, and I don't do what you Muslims say, because you got to say it's corrupt, because if you admit it's not corrupt, it buries Islam. No, no, it's changed. But then I read this corrupt Bible, how beautiful the words are, much more mm -hmm. beautiful than your Quran, which is not corrupt. And I see Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus says, I am the truth. No prophet says that. Mm -hmm. Only your God says in the Quran. I am the life, something only your God says. But then he says, he brings you to the Father. So is Allah your Father? No. And yet Jesus said, he is my Father. So you just proved your Allah is Satan. So why are you following Allah? He's not the God revealed in Jesus. Because I don't believe that God revealed in Jesus. But you just told me Jesus is Messiah, the son of Mary. Of course you believe that God revealed himself in Jesus. But I never said that God revealed himself into Jesus. Oh, so then when Jesus came, he wasn't revealing God to you? What was he revealing then? The word of God. And the word of God is what? God's revelation so you can know who God is? Yes. Okay, so God revealed himself in Jesus. So did God revealed God himself God in every prophet. God revealed himself in Muhammad because Muhammad is a liar. So did God revealed himself into Moses, Abraham? And Moses and Abraham said God is the father, which you just buried yourself. Because Moses said God that sent him is the father mm -hmm. of Israel. You sure you want to go with Moses here? Deuteronomy. So God revealed himself in Moses, in Abraham, in every prophet? Now what reveal meaning he sent them to make people know who God is. And Jesus mm -hmm. says the God that I make known is my father. And if you believe in me, he will be your father. But now let me show you the God of Moses. Deuteronomy okay. 14. This is now the Old Testament that the Jews follow and not just Christians. This mm -hmm. is the same Old Testament of the Jews who are not Christians. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. You are the sons of Yahweh, your God. You are the sons of Yahweh, your God. So here the God revealed in Moses who sent Moses to make mm -hmm. himself known. He says, you are the sons of God. You're my sons. Again, are you a son of Allah? No. So then you don't worship the God of Moses. You're lying.
Because God of Moses said, those who follow the covenant that I established, Moses, they are my sons. So your Allah is not the God of the Jews revealed in their Torah that they believe is not corrupt, which we accept with them, nor is it the God that sent Jesus to make us know that that God is the father of Jesus. And if we believe in Jesus, he'll be our father. You just admit that's not your God. So why should I follow your Quran? Like I said earlier, I don't know. So then why do you follow it? Exodus 4.22 here again. This is Old Testament. Ask the Jews. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, can you open up your Old Testament? Can you read this? It reads the same way because these books were with them before that we had them. Okay, Exodus 4.22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Israel is my son, my firstborn. And then I read to you the Psalms mm -hmm. where he says to the king, you are my son, today I've begotten you. So do you believe the king, the Messiah king, or even David the king is the begotten son of God? That was anointed, whether David or Solomon or Jesus. Mm -hmm. That that king is God's son, begotten by God? No. Okay. So the God of Moses says, Israel is my firstborn son. The God who sent David, who sent yes. Solomon, who will raise up the king says, you are my son today, I've begotten you. The God who sent Jesus said, this is my son, I'm his father. And Jesus says, I take you to my father. And if you believe in me, he'll be your father. But the God of Muhammad says, no, I'm not a father to anyone. Who do you want me to believe? All these different prophets and their writings that came before Muhammad or say, no, nah, it's all corrupt. I'll follow Muhammad. You must be on drugs to follow Muhammad. I'll be honest with you because Moses says, God is the father. We are his sons. David says, the kings of Israel are the sons of God and he is their father. Jesus says, God is my father. I'm his son. If you believe me, you'll be sons of God. Muhammad comes and says, no, Allah is a father to no one. None of us are his sons. But well, let me show you other prophets. These are now these are the Jewish prophets, the scriptures that the Jews have yeah. except. So it's not just our scripture here. Isaiah 63, 16. Now here he says to God, for you are our father, though mm -hmm. Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us. You, O Yahweh, are our father. Our redeemer from everlasting is your name. Isaiah 63, verse 16 and Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Yahweh, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. So Isaiah says, God is our father. Moses says, God is our father. David says, God is our father. And he begot me to be a son to rule for him. Solomon says, God is my father, I'm his son. Jesus says, God is my father, and if you believe me, you are sons. Mm -hmm. Muhammad says, Allah is not the father, we're not his sons. So I got multiple witnesses, all before the Quran, agreeing, and Muhammad comes and contradicts, and you want me to follow Islam. So then how can your God be the God of David and Moses and Isaiah and the God revealed by Jesus? I'm still waiting for that answer that you kept trying to avoid. I don't know. I hear you have it. I don't know. It's not. When are you going to realize your Quran is a joke because the Bible proves your Quran is false? This is why you got to say the Bible is corrupt. I mean, I never identified with the term Christian. I was That's a hypocrite back then. That's fine. What I'm saying is still didn't really okay. Even though I'm a hypocrite, still my background is Christian. Maybe I should just pick up the Bible and read Matthew, Mark, Luke. And, not saying you were, but you said you come from mm -hmm. that background. So you already knew about Christianity. So you should have said, hmm, let me pick up the Bible. Let me read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, learn about Jesus. Instead, you didn't even think about picking up the Bible. Someone gave you a Quran. You read, oh, wow, this is true. Where is no, it? I'm not look, Sam. I mean, like, back then I said I was a hypocrite and, like, I made fun of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And I would say I feel like, I don't know the term right now, but... That's fine. So why not... don't you go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? You've read the Quran, right? Yes. Why don't you now take a week or two mm -hmm. weeks, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just read it. Not to believe it, just read it. What but I mean, how could I, like, read the book where I made fun of? But Jesus said, all blasphemies against me will be forgiven. All blasphemies against me will be forgiven, if you ask. So you let Satan play with your mind because you're afraid that I insulted him and he will never forgive me, and you ran to another religion? That's I mean, I just didn't just um, insult him. I insulted the Father, the Holy Spirit, the prophets. Well, okay, but the Holy Spirit, blasphemy the Holy Spirit is when the Spirit convicts you and he keeps trying to get your attention and you keep resisting him. And then you reach a point where he's done with you. But he's not done with you because if he was done with you, you wouldn't be talking to me. Start reading Matthew, then Mark, Luke, and John.
Take a week or two. Just read it to yourself. Mm -hmm. When you're done, come back to me. And if you have more questions, we talk. In Islam, a Muslim man cannot reject marriage with a nine-year-old because of her age. The only reason he would reject is because he's not a faithful Muslim. Well, you're also her guardian, so you'd be able to object. Do you understand what I just said? In Islam, a guardian cannot object to his nine-year-old being married to a Muslim because of her age. The only reason he rejects because he's not pious enough, or he may impose a hefty dowry, which is on Islamic. Yeah, I don't Islamically, believe Islamically, if he's if he's a good Muslim, a devout Muslim, a God-fearing Muslim, and he's pious and he's responsible, there is no grounds for the father not to give his nine-year-old because it is Muhammad's example, and it's part of 65 verse 4 of the Quran, and it's part of Sharia that you can marry a nine-year-old. The father would still have to consent. His and he consents consent because he, if you go to a mufti, see, I got to have to educate you. See, either you're being a liar, and the fact that you're even trying to just fight shows how sick and dangerous you are. If he were to go to a mufti and said, the father is not allowing me to marry his nine-year-old because she's nine, he would be considered a kafir because then he's going against Muhammad Sunnah. You understand that, right? Did I make it clear? Yeah, the reason isn't because she's the, like the letter, the number age. It's just because that he doesn't want her to. Oh, to. okay, good. So you admit the age is okay, yeah. though. It's not it's, like a number. It's not like a number. Well, thing. it's okay if she's nine. He wouldn't say no, 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 no. She's immature, right? Well, the parent would have to consent. Let me repeat the question again, which is an answer. If she's nine, it's okay that she's nine. So if he doesn't consent, it's not because of her age, right? If he doesn't consent, then there's probably some reason. But not the age, right? It cannot be the age. Islamically speaking, according to Sunnah Sharia, he cannot reject because of her age. Can you prove that? Yeah. If I have to prove it, you know, I'm going to tear Muhammad to shreds. Yes, I can. Your prophet's example, chapter 65, verse 4 of the Quran, all of your commentaries and your Muslim scholars. And here, let me prove it to you. Prove there that you the person must accept. No, that's not what I said. Let me repeat it again. Can't refuse. If he rejects marriage, if a Muslim man wants to marry his nine-year-old, if he rejects it on the ground she's too young, he's an unbeliever. He cannot reject on that ground. You understand? He can't re He can't reject on the grounds of... That she's age nine, alone. she's too young. It has to be some other reason. Yeah. Okay, so you agree. So I don't need to prove it because I got my article and I link to Slam Q&A. I link to Bukhari and Muslim and all of that. Do I need to give you the link to my article where then no, I link fine. to the... No, so we you, establish so, that, right? So we agree. It's not only the, the, the number Notice how you just switched my words again. You see how you just switched my words? You said, do we agree? It's not only. See, you're lying. I didn't say that. I said, he cannot object because she's young. Why are you twisting my words? No, no, no. It's, you said young, young, but that's not, the, that's not the issue. Nine. Okay, nine is not young. The, the age nine. Okay. So let's try it again. You demonize misfit. Can a Muslim, if he is a Sunni and faithful to Muhammad, say you cannot marry my nine-year-old because she's too young? Yeah. No, you can't. You're lying through your teeth, you satanic bastard. Are you lying to me? Oh, okay. I'm saying he has the grounds to object. Let me repeat it a fourth time. According to the Sunnah, a Muslim man cannot say to a Muslim, you cannot marry my daughter because she's nine. He cannot reject it because of her age. Yes or no? Because I'm All about right. to post your prophet. The, the, you said there was an Islam QA link. Could you share that? Yeah. And it comes from Fath al-Bari, volume 11, page 25, libraryislamweb.net, and they removed the chi. I wonder why. Okay, but let me read what he said. Muslim schools of jurisprudence unanimously allow the marriage of young girls, even if they were still babies in the cradle, but intercourse cannot occur until the girl can withstand penetration. <whistles> All right, now here's the part that I quote in my paper. Are you ready? C could you just quote from the Islam? Yeah, QA? well, here, find it. Open up. It says, firstly, Islam does not give a specific age for marriage. Do you see that? Okay, you caught it, right? And yeah, what I'm does he go to prove to prove that point? Chapter 65, verse 4, right? Yep. Okay, so what did I say to you earlier? No Muslim can object to a man marrying a nine-year-old because of her age, because you just read there is no age for marriage, no age limit, because of 65, verse 4, which envisions a scenario of young girls who haven't had puberty, premature, prepubescent minors, who haven't had puberty, who have been married and had sex and divorced. And here, let me read what it says, Tafsir al-Sadi. Al-Sadi said, along with those who, who have it 
not, who have not had their menses, means minors, those who have not yet started to menstruate. Oh, you caught it? Okay, now let's go to, with regards to females, go back, you see that part where it says, with regards to females? The father may give his minor virgin daughter who has not yet reached the age of nine in marriage, and there is no difference of opinion concerning that. So you can even give a woman in marriage before nine, but watch the condition, right? There is no difference of opinion concerning that if he gives her in marriage to someone who is compatible. Ibn al-Mundir said, all of those scholars from whom we acquired knowledge unanimously agree that it is permissible for a father to give his minor daughter in marriage if he arranges her to someone who is compatible. And it is permissible for him to do that even if she is reluctant. You know the only condition is? Before nine? And I'm going to give you another article I want you to find on way back. You know what the only condition is? Before nine? You know what it is? You listen, buddy? I'm talking to you. Yeah. Okay. Let's, the only let's... condition is if she's before nine, she must be able to handle penetration. But then it says when she's nine, you can penetrate whether she can handle or not. Here's the other article. Here's the other article. He's going to try to find way back. Find out way back and give me the link. They have What's to be the, physically. Wait, wait, they have to be physically uh, mature. No, read thing. it. I just quoted it. It's there and it's online. Who are you lying to? It says nine. Then you can penetrate. Who are you lying to, man? I gave it right in front of your eyes. Uh, at the bottom of the first Islam QA, it says, "Fourthly, a man should not consummate marriage with with his regard young bride to female. until she is physically able to okay, bear." Okay, finish anymore. it. Keep going because it says, "But if she's nine, then you can penetrate. Finish it. No, I'm using the first one that we were on before. Keep reading. Yeah. Um, this varies from one time, place, and environment to another. Uh, what young men and guardians of girls should do is hasten to arrange marriages so as to guard chastity and protect honor as yeah. and, yeah, and so too as to attain. Here's the part. You're, you're taking too long. Here's the part. It's, it's in the comments. Read that for me. I just sent it to you. If the husband and the guardian of the girl agree upon something that will not cause harm to the young girl, then it may be done. If they disagree, then Ahmad and Abu Abayyad say that once a girl reaches the age of nine, then the, ma the marriage may be consummated even without her consent. Repeat that again. Oh. <laughs> That may be consummated. You're laughing at that, sense. you sick bastard? You think it's funny? No, I think that's bad. That's pretty bad. Okay, good. So your laughter is disgust. You're laughing from disgust, right? Yeah, I don't agree with um, that consensus. You're not Muhammad. You're not the Muslims. You're not the Quran. You're not the Sunnah. That's why you need to leave. Oh, his name is Jalil? Well, guys, guess what? Praise report. He just left me this message. Hi, Sam. It's Jalil from earlier. I found Jesus. Thank you. He left Islam, folks. So He's a Christian. Monday, like uh. Yeah, well, what specifically do you need to understand? Here, ask me. I'm here. That's well, what the, what the deity of Christ like? I need a better explanation. That's all I wanted. Yeah. Like, well, be more specific. What it's because there, I can answer this from five million ways. And I'm actually, I'm exaggerating when I say that. But you are stumbling on the deity of Christ. But you need to tell me what area so I can answer appropriately and not answer in a manner that won't help you. Uh, just, you know what? I understand what you're saying. Um, more about the Trinity. Yeah. Well, not being too specific, so I'm assuming what you're trying to tell me, because I'm trying to figure out what's the stumbling block. You're trying to wonder how, if God is one, he can be three persons? Yes. Yeah. Well, my first question for you, if you're thinking logically and thinking rationally, and again, logic and rationality can take you only so far. Revelation has to take you the rest of the way, meaning no matter how much you meditate, on creation, you will come to a conclusion there's a God, but you won't know who that God is and what he's exactly like. So if there is a God, if there is, and we both believe there is, he in his love and mercy, if he created, he didn't create it to be hidden. He created it to be known by his creatures because we believe he created out of love, so he'll make himself known. So God would then, in his love, need to reveal who he is, what he's like. So when we talk about the Trinity, the Trinity is something that God has revealed about himself. Where people get tripped up is because there's nothing in creation that's identical to the Trinity. It doesn't make sense to them how, if you're one being, you can be more than one person. But now let's question that. If you believe God is beyond comprehension and unlike anything in creation, 
<clears throat> would it surprise you and shock you that God's mode of existence, the way he exists, is completely anything, completely like anything in creation, and there'd be nothing identical to it, and so that the way he exists would transcend our ability to fully understand? Yes, that makes sense. So that's number one. The Trinity is unlike anything in creation. <clears throat> There's nothing identical to the Trinity, and we're not able to fully comprehend it, which should be expected if we're dealing with an infinite mind, a being that's beyond comparison, who exists in a completely different way than the way creatures do. So the fact that you have a struggle with the Trinity, that doesn't mean it's not true because you sound like a very intelligent man, and I'm not saying that to patronize, patronize you. You know that even in creation, even among scientists, there are things within creation, as limited and temporal it is, that they know are realities, but they don't understand how. They yeah, see it, but they don't comprehend it. But that doesn't mean they deny the reality of what they're seeing, right? That is true. That's uh, For example, I'm an a auto technician, and some of these cars, people you watch uh, say this and that, but you still got to get a different understanding. So it makes sense. So, so that's number one. Just because you can't figure out the Trinity... That doesn't mean it's not true, because if God is infinite, then expect that God will be beyond your ability to truly comprehend his infinitude. But secondly, when we say God is one, even when we say God is one, that needs to be defined. One what? Because people say one God, like the Muslims will tell you, Ahad, Ahad, or Wahid, Wahid. Okay, one what? For example, I can speak of one family, but a family consists of more than one person, right? Yes. I can speak of one nation. But a nation consists of millions people. of people, right? Yes. So even when I say one, one what? What do you mean by one? You mean one numerically so that two comes after one? Do you mean one in, in his essence, one in his being? He's one community. So that in itself doesn't tell me what it means for God to be one. That's the second thing. That's the second thing. For, for example, <clears throat> I'm going to give you analogies that are not identical to God, but analogies from creation. You're in your car, right? Yes. Okay. That's one car, right? Yes. How many doors? Four doors. How many wheels? Four wheels. Does it have an engine, transmission, and so on? Yes. But that's confusing. I thought you said it's one car. How can one car have four doors, four, four <clears throat> tires, and an engine, and a trunk? You see, you get the point, right? Yeah, all the components make up to one. You got it. So for me to know what it means for God to be one, he has to explain it to me. He has to explain to me what it means for him to be one. To add to that point, the only reason why you think there's a problem with one being being more than one person is because that's your frame of reference. That's your experience in the temporal finite creation. In the temporal finite creation, if you're one being, you're one person. But how do you know that if you go to a higher level of existence, that you can't be one being and more than one person? How would you know that? I wouldn't know that until I reach that point. That's my point. So if God tells you I exist and I exist unlike anything creation and my being is not limited the way your being is, that it's limited to a single person, right? Yeah. Then this is how I exist. My existence transcends your existence. It's not multiple gods, but this one God is the Father in union with his eternal word, the Son, and eternal spirit. <clears throat> and that's <clears throat> the one God. So the one God cannot be other than the Father and his eternal word, his Son, and his eternal spirit. Can't be. That's what makes the one God the one God. So this is just who he is. So beyond that, I don't know what more I can add to help you because the problem people face is because from their frame of reference, because we're not God, we don't have an infinite mind, we don't see the way God sees, we're creatures bound to time, space, and place, and we're bound in a world that is finite, limited, and temporal, so we only assess by what we see and experience. And in my experience, every being is a single person, which is also not completely true. Have you ever looked at Siamese twins? Yeah. So even in among finite temporal created things, you do have 
beings that are multi-personal, but we see that as a deformity because we know it's not normal for a human being to be more than one person. So when we see Siamese twins, we know that's a deformity, but still nonetheless, there you have two persons attached to one body. Yeah. Right? But that's a deformity, obviously, because God did not design human beings to be multi-personal and that one being is more than one person. In fact, if you have a person that's multi-personal, we call that a disease. That's schizophrenia. Because you can have in the psyche of a human being where he's he has multiple personalities and one personality is not aware of the other. That is a fact. But that's schizophrenia. But that too is a deformed. That's a defect. Right? Yes. So is that clear? Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. Now I have a better understanding. But now let me give you a final example from Scripture, even from finite temporal things, the creation of man. Not that God is identical to physical beings because he, he's not a physical being. He's not bound to time, space, and place. And we don't say there's a male and female in the Godhead. So we don't have God the Father and God is the mother, right? Yeah. But in creation, God said, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness. But then it says, Adam is them. Let them have dominion over the world. I'm, just, I'm summing up the passage. So here he says, I create Adam. This Adam, he is in my image. But then he says, this Adam is them. And Genesis 127 tells us that Adam is male and female. The male and the female together are the one Adam. And in Genesis 5 verse 2, Genesis 5 verse 2, it says, in the day he created them, male and female, and the day that he created them, male and female, he called them and named them Adam. So the male is called Adam. The female, his wife, is called Adam. And then in Genesis 2, 24, it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Basar achad. Okay, now, here's the problem. Eve, the female has her own flesh body. She's a distinct physical being. The male Adam, her husband, has his own physical body. He's a distinct physical being, but it says the two are one. So here you can have two distinct physical beings, physical persons, still being one. How much more God, who's not limited the way we are. Yep. So now what the problem, what, problem could we have in saying well i don't know i can't figure out the trinity so what you can't figure it out there's a lot of things you can't figure out in creation but you don't deny their reality the most important question is not whether you can figure out the trinity it's whether the trinity is true and how do you know it's true well if god is real and he's revealed himself we now need to see where he has revealed himself and then take him at his word and i believe that's the holy bible god's perfect words perfectly preserved and there in this book that's the word of God. I am told the one God is a father with his eternal son and his eternal spirit. And the one God cannot be other than the father with his eternal son and his eternal spirit.